Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get started, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda, uh, and I don't think that there are any changes uh, relative to what is printed online. So, and you know what we have in paper here. So, um, are there any um, changes people would like to see to the agenda? Okay, so uh, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Um, so the next thing is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, if the item is on the agenda, then if you would wait till that item comes up, and then you can speak then. And then um, if you have anything to say, and this is true uh, generally throughout the meeting, if you would say your name and where you live and uh, try to keep your comments to uh, two minutes. Yep. My name is Seth Collins. I live in Berlin, Vermont. And I would like to request a uh, or Mont or, sorry. I'd like to request Montpelier City Hall to set up a task force to uh, to uh, to create this neighbor or to start creating this neighborhood watch. Um, and what? Uh, yeah, the, I, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, I have another meeting to go to, but th thanks thanks for letting me speak. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, uh, all right, so moving on to uh, the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so, and we have uh, an above and beyond award. We do, I was actually just looking, I don't see the recipient here. Do we know if he's planning to attend? <laughs> he's working. <laughs> he could be. So I guess I'm going to try and say this for the record. I think that Dan you Introduce Perry, yourself. Is it? Introduce oh, yourself. I'm sorry. This is Donna Barlow, Casey, Public Works Director. Um, our staff needs to be in at 4 a.m. tomorrow. He's the streets foreman. I think he went home with the rest okay. of our guys. Um, and uh, I, that's where he is. So Maybe he can do his job tomorrow. Maybe you give a little tomorrow. description. So our, we, for those that don't know, we, once a month we give an <laughs> above and beyond award to a city employee. It's nominated by fellow city employees, and then they're recognized internally and, and here at the council meeting. So this year's, this month's winner is uh, named Dan Perry. He's just a newly promoted superintendent or supervisor of our streets division. And uh, he has, particularly with this weather, winter with sort of staff shortages, has really stepped up and filled in the role even before his formal promotion. He's done a lot to reduce salt. He's one of those folks that just comes out. I noticed he had just answered an email to someone just right before this meeting, uh, a citizen concerned about things. And um, so he, his, his fellow, some of his fellow employees recognized that and, and nominated him. And our team that looks at these uh, agreed. So we'd just like to thank Dan Perry for his service. We thought he was going to be here to be recognized, but. But he's so dedicated to the city he's so that he's preparing for tomorrow at 4 a.m. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. So there we go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, and congratulations to Dan. Yes. Yes. It's very exciting. Anything further on that? No. Nope. Okay. All right. So the next item is a climate emergency resolution, uh, and I know there are some folks here who would like to speak to that, and there are a number of folks, and so I, I would um, also just urge you to, to keep your comments uh, to two minutes if you can. That'd be great. Uh, and then. Um, so we'll have public comment, and then we'll have some discussion uh, with the council. So anyone who would like to uh, make a comment about uh, the climate resolution? Yes. Or sit. Hi. I'm Kelly McCracken. I live here in town. I just want, I, I helped work on this, and I just want to say that the intent of this emergency declaration is twofold, to both hold up the city as a model and to hold its feet to the fire. We want to acknowledge the city's leadership on climate and support its ambitious efforts to achieve city-based net zero emissions by 2030 and community-wide net zero by 2050. The city has adopted these goals. 
and now the plan and timeline to reach them must be created with both speed and thoughtfulness. The whole city must mobilize to meet these goals. Residents and students at MSMS and MHS have worked together, meeting with members of the council and MEAC to create this declaration. And we ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dan Jones. Um, I want to support the idea of declaring a climate emergency. Sadly feel that this particular declaration is caught in the weeds and doesn't actually address the crisis in any meaningful way. And I'm saddened that this declaration walks back the 2014 commitment to only now apply to city operations by 2030. It pushes off an actual commitment for citywide changes until 2050 and only then frames actions in terms of greenhouse gas reductions. That horse left the barn. The recent IPCC report tells us all that we've not massively, if we don't massively shift our consumption of behavior by 2030, it's game over. I respectfully propose that the council consider a real climate emergency declaration, which would recognize that the climate crisis effects are here and now, not often some preventable future. We already find our water system is compromised by unexpected freeze-thaw cycles. Here, here. Our roads and systems will get worse from here on in. This year, we've already had five January thaws in January. We see increases in sewage overflows and in stormwater events. Yet somehow, the city goes on as if the situation is normal and can be contained with traditional approaches of orderly infrastructure replacement. An emergency situation requires preparation of and commitment to an emergency response. A true emergency response will require public commitment to changing current land and water use and infrastructure plans such that we might prepare to actually survive a climate change future. For instance, are we going to continue to dedicate our downtown real estate to parking lots, assuming that we're always going to be a commuter hub for rural sprawl? In a real emergency, the city must be prepared to actively subsidize new transit as part of reorganizing our current transport and utility systems. Our city needs a process of real internal accounting of the true state of current expenditures for repairing the climate damages. Like how many water main breaks does it take before we have to fix that problem? Responding to the growing real emergency will require concrete mechanisms to support sustainable investment that will provide future security and well-being for our citizens. Declaring a climate emergency without being prepared to create real adaptation has little value in defining what we need to demand of ourselves in this ever more challenging future. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I'm a, a page curtain. I'm embarrassed to say I haven't read the resolution. Is it possible to read it? Or is it too long? Um, it's, I don't think it's too long. Does anybody um, else want to hear it, or do you all? I mean, maybe. Okay. It's, it's about a page and three quarters. Oh, never mind. Never mind. We could, uh, well, I was going to say, the, we could read the, um, the be it yeah, further resolved. It oh, you've got it. Okay. Um, is that sufficient page? Page that works for you? Yes. Okay. Great. It starts where I hand Okay, um, <coughs> further comments? Uh, Diane Kagan, uh, Montpelier. I, I really would like to understand what this council understands the word emergency to mean. I think that's been, that was raised by uh, Greta Thornburg at the uh, <coughs> World Economic Conference this past month, and I think she posed it to all of us. I don't know if there are any high school kids here, but they've really shown the way in demanding that the city and the state act in accordance with reality and not with our wishes. I, as a citizen of Montpelier who does not drive a car, I'm gonna tell you this is a car town. Several people have been killed right here on Main Street, and no one has been held responsible for it. 
when I comb my hair in the morning after I've been walking about in the fresh air of Montpelier, I can't even tell you what comes out of it. And I'm not the only one. The water situation here and the state of affairs with the river really needs to be addressed. I walk. <laughs> I only live a few blocks from downtown. But it's black ice and puddles. The kids can't walk safely on Hubbard Street. is a is a traffic emergency. So I really I really support the idea of of, of a climate emergency. But I'd like to see us actually address things in a manner that you would deal with emergency. Like when your house is on fire, do you wait till 2050 to put it out? No. You know, I mean, the well-to-do in Montpelier are going to do fine. They've got their houses up in God knows where. You know, but the people on the streets of the city who actually have to walk and take public transportation are in, are in dire distress. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just speaking from the heart here because uh, a lot of people in this town are tired of it and people are going to start leaving. I mean, I will not stay in this town if the situation continues this way. Not that my absence would be missed particularly, but uh, it's, not, it's not a livable situation unless you've got a lot of money and then you can go off and ignore it and put a lot of gas in your three SUV vehicles and drive your Jeep up in the hills and go skiing, I don't know where. So I think it's also a question of class that we have to consider and whether all the citizens are going to benefit from this, from this activity, and that's all I've got to say. Thank you. I'm moving to France. <laughs> um. I'm Lena D'Onofrio. I'm in seventh grade. And I'd just like to say that I believe Montpelier should declare climate emergency because the communities most vulnerable to climate change are those with the fewest resources available. And we are a community that has the means and resources to hold itself accountable for its emissions. And yet the amount of carbon Vermont's been emitting has been consistently going up. We must take steps to lower the <coughs> negative impacts our city has on the environment and do the hard work necessary to get to net zero. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Lynn Wild, and I live here in Montpelier on St. Paul Street. Five years ago, we began planting trees on St. Paul Street. It's called the St. Paul Street Tree Project. That was a project of the Montpelier Tree Board, the neighbors on St. On, uh, Paul Street, and um, the church on the corner. Together, we added 23 trees to that street to try to make up for the 10 large maple trees that had died over the past decade. Adding plants and trees to our yards and to improve the diversity of, of living species in our yards is a, fun, a focus that we can all take, whether we have a yard of our own or if we want to add them to other people's yards or join up in partnership with people who have really large properties and are willing to let us work with them. The little trick to this is they need to be native plants. And I just discovered this myself. I've been really gung-ho about this whole thing, more diversity, more diversity, more diversity. But the caveat is that the insects that we need must be used to eating the plants that we plant. And if we plant diverse species that are not native to our local region, then we are not going to be able to feed them. And that's really the Bottom line here, we've got to begin feeding the different insects that used to live here because those are the things that the birds feed on and those are the things that start creating the plant health in our environment and the soil health. So not to lecture or anything, but just saying 
It's complicated. So I invite you, and the tree board invites you to join us and to ask us to plant trees in your yard, to join with the Friends of the Winooski, to plant trees along the riverbanks, to hold the soil in place, to create the diversity on the riverbanks that then creates more insects that should live here, that can fight the insects we don't want. Only 1% of the insects give us any problem. There's a whole million of other insects that, that we could be supporting if we choose the right native plants in the right places with the trees. So Lynn Wild, Tree Board, join us, Friends of the Winooski River. Uh, we're planning and pl for planting in May. May Tree City is coming. Let's do it. Let's, let's get on this. Thank you. My name is Daryl Bloom. I live in Montpelier on Summer Street. I don't have prepared remarks, but I did read the declaration presented to the uh, council, and I urge you to support it. it. What could be more reasonable? Think of the number of times you've heard adults say to children, come on now, be reasonable. What could be more reasonable than for us to be asked to make an actual plan to meet the goals that we all know are important. We know those goals are important. We know there may not really be enough, but they'll get us going in the right direction. Lynn's talk is a perfect example of the resources that exist in the, in the community. And the plan encourages you to listen to all of the community in creating a plan to reach those goals. So I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right, so uh, comments from council. Do you, do you want to start, Lauren? I'm you don't have to. I mean, I, I'll just say a few words. And then, um, so just first of all, really appreciate the students and parents and adults who um, did a lot of work putting this together, looking at what you know a lot of communities all over the globe have declared climate emergencies already. Um, we wouldn't even be the first city in the state of Vermont. Burlington beat us to the punch. So um, this is something that's happening all over. And I think a lot of the comments that have come out tonight of our house is on fire and we need to start acting like it um, are really resonate with me. Um, I do think we have set goals, but without accountability and plans to get there and embedding this, um, how we do our business into the city's operations, then we're not gonna make the kind of transformative change that I think we need. So I do think this this emergency, well, it, we need to be doing more sooner, faster on the climate emergency. I think putting a plan in place to do that and being as bold and ambitious um, as we can in that, I would encourage us to do. And I would encourage everyone who's here tonight and the many other community members really passionate and really concerned about the climate crisis to hold the city accountable to developing a really good plan and then following through on actually implementing it um, so that whoever's here is being held accountable to doing the kind of work that needs to get done. Um, and that's both driving down our own pollution that we're contributing, um, but also building and investing in a, a city that will be resilient over the long term um, from our infrastructure to our food systems and, and everything in between. So I encourage us to uh, support this and um, look forward to the discussion. Dan. And then Donna. Did I say one more? Oh, thing? no, not right now. Um, so, but uh, perhaps later, but uh, so we have council discussion. Yes. Sure. I just had a couple of questions, um, one of which um, maybe Lauren, you can answer this and it comes from my being new on the council, but so what type of group came up with this as far as the planning <coughs> and work that went into d drafting this resolution? So there were just Montpelier residents who were looking at what was happening and were concerned about the issue and did. So some of the folks who spoke tonight were the ones right. who drafted and, and wrote this and 
did a lot of research on what the city had done. They presented at the Montpelier Energy Action Committee um, and got some input from that group in terms of some of the substance that's in here that speaks um, directly to the city's goals and, and operations. Um, but that's my understanding of what went into it. And then who, who would, I mean, obviously it says that the city, city council would create and adopt the plan, but would we see a subcommittee then out of this? Or is this more of a, yes, we need to make a plan and let the details fall forward? So two that? things. One, if you would pull your mic a little closer, can you talk? Um, <laughs> uh, two, uh, so the first part, the 2030 mm -hmm. uh, goal for city operations, um, we uh, that is embedded in the uh, FY21 budget currently, so that is underway, which is great. And then, but we do not yet have um, uh, plans to develop a 2050 plan. Um, but that, yeah. But I guess I, you know, my question is, to, to whom would the work fall? Uh, are, you know, we're looking at creating a, a task force of this, or is this an internal city process where a department would take care, we the would lead on it? I mean, our, this would be probably overseen mostly by MIAC, uh, the Mobular Energy Advisory Committee, with a consultant. We would contract out the, the work to sort of lead the research and that kind of thing, and then present through MIAC. Obviously, we'd have city staff involved, uh, probably our public works director, and then uh, report through MIAC and then to the council to adopt the plan. And then is the envisionment, sorry, I'm just okay. asking questions as opposed to necessarily expressing opinion, but I want to make sure I fully understand and everyone understands as well, um, then are we envisioning a plan that would then be binding upon the city that we would vote upon that would then control how we would make these plans such that, you know, future plans, future councils, future departments would be bound by the, this plan that we adopt? I would... Um equate it to other plans the city has, um, which are guiding documents. Mm -hmm. uh, and because really, we uh, these plans that are talked about here are going to need to come up with like the nuts and bolts of, okay, but how are you actually gonna accomplish that? Right. And that's where the creativity, I mean, this is sort of like a, it's almost like a blank slate. It's like, a, well, it's not quite true. It's, it's the framework, it's like the foundation that we can build on for, um, creating what will actually right. happen, but that as a plan, it, uh, it wouldn't be binding unless we made it binding. Okay. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I was just yeah. going to follow into that. Normally, these plans would come with a series of recommendation, action recommendations, and then obviously we would go through and choose the, the actions we were going to take, and some of them could go into ordinance, and it, you know, it could always be undone by future councils that any, any, of, any of our regulations can be. Uh, sure or strengthened. Okay. And well, no. say so it may be worth noting that the city is currently working on uh, its city plan, mm -hmm. uh, which has an energy chapter, uh, which does get to some of these um, strategies. Well, that, that actually anticipated. I just wondered how that would then meld with the, our city plan, which would, as you say, can include an energy chapter, and I would see it focused on that and how this would be different than that that section. Yeah, I'd, think I'd see it as being more robust. Okay. I mean, the, it would just have more detail and like thing you know, we can and to the extent that it either differed or expanded upon the city plan, um, we could amend the plan, you know, that chapter to to mm -hmm. address those you know, more detailed responses. Well, and, and I'll end so the others have a chance to talk. But I, you know, my, my concern obviously is we want to make sure that if we do create a document like this, that it is consistent and supported by other planning documents, that it doesn't sit at odds with those. And it's, we're not setting some goals in, in one document and other goals in another, as well as, you know, and, and I could see a document like this being more robust and more uh, looking at a bigger slice of, of the pie, yet, you know, in some ways the city plan is intended to be that way. So I could see this working hand in glove and maybe we're looking beyond, and obviously by these these dates, we're looking beyond the five-year sort of city plan that we, we would normally have. So I appreciate the answers and the time for the questions. Thank you. Donna. Okay. I definitely can support making a motion to make a plan. I have some questions about the date and need to talk to Bill and some of the answers to Dan is about staffing. How much of our staff 
because we do have new directors, new city office staff, so that concerns me as far as 2020. And I think an FY year, so I think of FY21 because budget and staff planning goes with that way. So I feel comfortable, more comfortable with saying it would be completed by the end of FY21 as a motion. But within the resolution, I have five different groupings of questions. And I did send them to you, Lauren, uh, ahead of time. And some of them are real basic. I don't know you need such a detailed resolution, and, but some of the wording bothers me, um, such as in the very beginning, it says to mitigate damage due to climate change and to restore a safe climate. I don't know what a safe climate is. 350 parts per million. What? 350 parts per million of CO2 I think would be a fair. Is it, okay, then I guess I need something like, I just, okay. We can do that. Would okay. it, so we could, uh, it could be more specific like that to help define. If, if it, yeah, I mean, I guess if that's, if that's the gold here, to me that kind of specific gold really needs to go in the plan. And this is just a statement saying, we have these issues and we may resolve that we want to do a plan to resolve them versus trying to list each and every one within the resolution. I find it a little clumsy. Sorry. I'm not even finding that language. Maybe I'm just It's in the very first par paragraph, very first sentence, the heading. I see. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. No, no. Yep. Uh, no. Okay. So that was my initial question. Uh, and then... When you go on and it says, whereas Vermont has already experienced, I, I'm still thinking local, uh, Vermont, Montpelier, uh, and I felt that, like some of the statements, that we have a lot of damage already with streets, so that we have real problems of cost to our infrastructure and to staff time when we have a utility line go because of all these extreme ranges of temperatures. So I feel that in that, one, two, third, whereas, that that could be very much more specific if you're, if you're going to mention Montpelier. We have these problems right now that are costing us money for infrastructure and staff time. And then on the second, well, mine's the second page, it's near, one, two, three, four, like the fifth paragraph from the bottom. And I do think Montpelier can be a leader and an example for others, but I'm less comfortable with some of this commitment to global, um, you know, to reverse global warning. I mean, just it just jumps out out there. It's like, whoa. Um, so maybe I, I'm thinking more directly that we do our little pond, and we try to do it well, and that will lead others to follow us. But uh, anyway, so that was my issue. And then the fourth one is the first, be it further resolved. That's the timing issue. I feel more comfortable with FY21. And then the very last one, it gets into so much language, I have no idea what it means. I'm uncomfortable with them. That's which, all. Which, sorry, the last? The very last one, that will which investigate part? radical gas, um, greenhouse gases, transportation, heater sector, gas withdrawal opportunities, soil, carbon, and goes on and on and on. I said, is that like they're listing everything? I just like, why list anything instead of more of a broader heading? I just, again, it just, oh. In some cases, scientifically, I guess it gets too specific for me, and in the other cases, it gets too global. So I, I'm sorry to be fussy. But. Do you have any language change suggestions you want to offer? I don't, I don't know enough about the scientific topic. Okay. Okay. That's why I sent it ahead, hoping that maybe there would be some heads, uh, some Ed experts is. that could add to this. I just would like us to have more time and not feel like we have to do it tonight. That we can take in some of the comments and, and try to help trim it down to be more specific Montpelier, but not so intensely specific with all the things that are going wrong. <laughs> Does that make sense at all? Uh, I'm going to flag that, all of, all of those thoughts. I mean, um, let's come back to it, if that's okay. Other council comments? Uh, Glenn, and then Connor. Yep. Um, again, thanks for everyone coming out and, and doing the work on this. I think uh, I, I hear the concerns about the language. I think I'm 
I'm perfectly willing to see some of those changes, and I support it as written. Really, it it, it reads um, uh, broad enough and specific enough for me. And as far as I can tell, it it does uh, commit us only to doing what we have already said we are going to do and what we will need to do. Um, plans for 2030 and 2050. Uh, as far as the timing goes, end of FY21 versus end of this year, 2020, um, I guess to me it feels uh, urgent enough to have a plan to, to, to get 2030 that we should just do it now. Uh, by the end of 2020 feels adequate to me, especially because we have already been, been planning for it to some extent. Um, I share some of the commenters' fears that uh, even if we do manage to, to meet these goals that we've set for ourselves, uh, may still be inadequate. Um, but I think that, uh, as written for now, this is certainly something that I can support. Connor. Yeah, no, I, I agree with some of the concerns. I think you could look at some of this language and say, you know, maybe it's a bit duplicative of other, other policies we have. Um, I think you could also make the criticism that doesn't go far enough. Dan Jones, a lot of his points hit pretty hard there. And what I like about sustainable Montpelier is they actually have tangible ideas on how to get us on track here. So I think we would benefit from bringing them in more and hearing more about those ideas. Microtransit being an example, it's actually going to come to fruition, hopefully. Uh, but I think when it comes down to it for me, any resolution is a bit hollow unless you do the work and follow up. And I can't tell you how much I admire just the students in this community who camp out on the state house lawn in the cold, who go in the streets, put themselves on the line. And what I see this as, I see this as an evolution in sort of the movement that they've created for their own future. Um, it's not about just going to the streets and taking action. It's about putting some ideas on the table, working with elected officials, lobbying them. I got a ton of emails over the course of the week, very, very well written, very passionate about this. And I, I think what I, would, what I would ask the students back is this is not the end of the conversation. Um, if we pass this, this in itself is not a remedy. You need to hold us accountable and continue coming to the council meetings, continue hammering some of these issues. Uh, <coughs> but again, the passion I see, um, the work they've done, uh, I, I, I would have a lot of trouble voting against this resolution. I, I, I think this is a, a really good step for them, for them to take there. So thanks very much. Uh, Jack, do you have anything you want to add? Very little. I'm very happy to uh, vote in favor of this resolution just as it's written. Um, if, if there are enough people who think that we should uh, spend some time, more time working on it before we uh, uh, adopt it, I have no problem with uh, giving members the time to, uh, to do that and be totally comfortable with it and uh, take it up again next time. Sorry, so you su you're suggesting that maybe we uh, send it back to the community members who are working on this uh, for some language ed edits potentially and come back for next week or next meeting? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to vote yes tonight, but I also like the idea of having everybody be uh, yeah. on board yeah. right in, in support of it. Um, I, actually, I'd like to just ask Kelly McCracken to come back up here, if you wouldn't mind. As someone who is, was instrumental in putting this together, um, my question is, is really how, um, how would you feel about doing that based on some of the, the comments or clarifications that you've heard? Or at, I questions feel questions about fine about that. Yes. You do? OK. Um, you know, I agree that my personal um, declaration would ask for a lot more. <laughs> and I feel really good about just pushing the council to do what you already, I know what you already want to do. Yeah. So um, I don't think I took issue. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look at it, but yeah. no, that's okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I also just want to say that the, the, a lot of the, um, language comes that's not specific to, to us comes from 
other climate mobilization, the whole climate mobilization movement. And so we really tried to edit it to make it as specific as possible, but yeah. yeah. Perhaps we not can add layers, some, not, you know. yeah, we can add some Montpelier specific things and maybe clarify some of the, the points. Um, Lauren. Uh, the only, I, I think that sounds great. And if you're willing, thank you for, <laughs> for you and the, all the team who. I mean, I don't know that I can who, change it. Like I don't, I was happy with this. So I mean, yeah. if yeah. I'd have I, to understand who, who, what I'm doing. Sure but I would do it if I understood what I was doing. Okay. Yeah, the, <laughs> I think some of it just seemed like either let's keep it all Montpelier specific with the examples at the beginning, um, which seems fine, and maybe define safe climate, put a different phrase in that makes more sense to you. I mean, I, it didn't bother me, but I that, that seems like totally solvable. Like, f you raised the issue of um, national advocacy. Like, I, I mean, I know that I think we do some national advocacy on climate. We're part of national networks. I would not want to take that out. I think if there's opportunities for Montpelier to be part of a bigger city movement on climate, that we should absolutely do that. So I would push back on that one and say, I think, you know, I think that's limited. We're not, we don't do a lot of that. Most of this is all about what our city is doing. But I wouldn't want to take out the, you know, that that's something we would possibly look for opportunities. And I know the city already has before. So that one, I would um, just put that out there. Um, and then finally, the I, for the the sub, most substantive seems like the date of the plan. I mean, I I think it seems kind of ironic to say it's a climate emergency. Let's take a year and a half to make a plan. Like I think 2020 as a calendar year seems, given the work that's underway. Like if if there were you know not going to be funding, you know, like if we like physically couldn't make it work, but it seems like we can. Um, do our best to try to get one done uh, in the 2020 the calendar saying, year. I, didn't hear I just Bill I just saw it. a half-hearted maybe <laughs> nod, so I'll take that as a, so, a so firm. Think, Let's do it. Um, <laughs> well, I, have a work plan. You know, a work obviously plan. we will strive to do what you ask us to do. Um, the the funding that we approved in the budget, you know, starts July one. Yeah. Now we could probably, you know, speed that up by having us ready to go for July one. And obviously, any I, I'm actually more concerned about the subsequent year because we haven't considered funding for a fiscal year that begins July 1, 2021 into 22. So we're making a promise. Um, and we presumably the first plan is going to drive what the second plan is. But you know, again, you're the council. You're going to decide what we budget. So if you're making that commitment, then we'll do it. Um, it, it would. For us, it would just make more sense to have them line up with the fiscal year, but you know we'll do our best, and you will do our best to have it come out when you want it. But I, you know, well, I'm, I mean, if we don't fund the second part, that would be the classic unfunded mandate, um, <laughs> right. which has never occurred before in the history of government. <laughs> um, but you know, I th I think. This first plan is important enough that if what I'm hearing from you is that um, having it go to the deadline of fiscal year 2021, I mean, you know, the basically June 30th of next year, you know, I'd rather have that plan done right because it would be the first step than to rush it to meet some uh, goal that we set here on paper because it sounds it good on paper. Um, you know, the, the, the and uh, sorry, and I'll let you answer. Um, you know, to me, the the issues with the language, in especially in the whereas clauses. I mean, whereas clauses are just whereas clauses. They're not <laughs> binding. You don't take them serious, okay? No one takes them. <laughs> <laughs> then why well, do it? <laughs> well, because they do. They sort of set the background and the general tone. Um, and so I'm not so. I and I'll, I'll just say that's my own personal take. Is that I. I I'm not as bothered by that, and um, I think it's a good idea if we're, you know, if we've made this commitment to this plan, um, and if we all recognize this is a climate emergency, um, to start taking action. And the, so, to me, the real nut of this is to take action in, in a way that's going to go beyond the page and is going to result in policy and plans that we can follow that will be consistent with other plans that we're making so that we do start to bend the use of uh, you know our uh, both carbon and our infrastructure to support these issues um, and we do it right as opposed to doing it either rushed or um, you know doing it, it as a series of ongoing resolutions um, 
so we push more paper and we feel good about ourselves. I mean, I'd, I'd really like to see this as the first step and then see a plan. Um, Jack, and then I have a, a comment. Yeah. Um, as this discussion has been going on about the, the completion date of this plan, it occurs to me that if we want to be in a position to, uh, to be considering whatever we put in the plan as we build the fiscal year 2022 budget, probably we should have it done by December of this year, so then that can be an input for the uh, next fiscal year's budget. Um, so to address some of your comments, Donna, I have some suggestions. And so rather than perhaps s sending it back to the um, folks who helped write it, um, maybe there's some easy language changes that we could make right now if, if, um, if they're amenable to, uh, to you in the group. Um, and if they also satisfy you, Donna. Um, so I'm the only one that's concerned. No, that's no, fine. that's, well, that's. As I said, I can make the motion now to do the plan. I have no yeah. issue about the plan. Well, you know, if we're going to do it, let's do it right. I take resolution serious. What kind of that's good. That's good. Okay, so about the, about the first part, um, restoring a safe climate, because that was vague. My uh, interpretation of that is that that is, the first part is damage due to climate change, and then to restore a safe climate really means reducing greenhouse gases. Oh, okay. um, so I would suggest that we strike restore a safe climate and put in uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, because that's what I think that's trying to accomplish. Um, under the third whereas, where you have Vermont has already experienced long-term warming, extreme weather events, uh, serious flooding, and uh, I would suggest adding after uh, that, uh, M Montpelier has experienced multiple water main breaks in part due to extreme freeze-thaw cycles and more frequent major storm and snow events. Mm -hmm. This is a couple examples of Montpelier-specific um, impacts. Uh, and then, uh, the next part, you had some um, questions about the well, dates. I didn't realize we did global lobbying. I, I know that we are advocating yeah. as a city when we meet with other cities, but I really didn't know we did global yeah. lobbying. I thought lobbying is a very distinct. I'll, uh, I'll speak for myself and say that I, I have done that. Okay. been to some national conferences <laughs> talking about okay. our uh, uh, efforts, which is great. Yeah, that, yep. I think, okay, that, that's sharing and being a mentor. That's fine. OK. okay. okay. Great. great. Um, if you do that now, we'll just check it off. We'll OK. that pa paragraph alone. Um, <laughs> as for the dates, I'm hearing some disagreement about whether to change it to FY21 or FY20. And so maybe Jack we'll, made a good point there. Yes, I, I agree. Um, so it, I think it, if, it's, if it's pushing us to go a little faster, that's maybe that's OK, unless it's going to take away from the authenticity of it. But we can, we can have more conversation about that. Um, and then you had some concerns about what is involved in that last um, paragraph. Um, uh, I am happy to talk about any of those things in like a 20 second explanation on any of those. You if feel comfortable with them, I'll sign off, Anne. Okay. It's on your head. <laughs> um, well, if you have that question, if, if you, just because I'm a teacher, maybe I'll just do it anyway, just take. <laughs> Take 20 seconds. It's an opportunity, right, That's to talk board. about what's that? <laughs> <The board. laughs> yeah, 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 right. Exactly. I need the whiteboard. We're gonna, we're gonna draw some equations. No. Um, so uh, I think people understand tree planting, yep. um, soil car, uh, soil carbon sequestration. So uh, a lot of carbon is stored in soil, uh, particularly in roots and mycelium, uh, and uh, just other organisms that live. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem underground helps store carbon, uh, and uh, some of that is even, uh, you know, old plant matter uh, that's just under, under, you know, layers. Right. If it sits um, long enough, it becomes yep. cold. Yep. And so there are uh, things we can do to uh, increase carbon sequestration. Uh, planting trees is one of them, but um, there are other uh, things you can do to increase uh, sequestration. One of those things actually is pyrolysis, uh, which 
is a process um, by which you heat up material to very high temperatures uh, under pressure, uh, and it uh, uh, organic material will sort of turn into charcoal. Um, some of it vaporizes, and you can burn it, and that you are still burning some of that carbon then, but. Uh, but some of it for, um, becomes in uh, basically a locked state, uh, so it's out of the uh, out of the sort of decomposition cycle um, for a carbon. It sort of takes it out of the the carbon cycle, if that makes any sense. So so that's that has some potential. Um, Reduction of food waste. We know a lot of that food waste right now. Uh, in, in, in July, <laughs> theoretically, we That's we right, will not be to. throwing tra uh, food waste into the trash. But um, that is an opportunity for us to explore uh, potentially some more robust uh, composting opportunities, particularly with the city. So we, we're going to actually. Uh, Donna and uh, anyway, there's a group that's working on that, uh, and then climate adaptive um, land use planning. We know that climate um, solutions really are also about land use planning, which I think we we yep. know. Um, does that well? And it mentions transportation and heating sectors. Those transportation is the highest sector of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the state, uh, followed by uh, the heating sector. Does, is that satisfactory? Perfect. Okay, thank you for, sorry, that was probably five minutes. Sorry, that was too. Yeah, it doesn't inc include everything that Dan would like to see in it. But. Oh, for sure. And and I would say oh, this is not an exhaust, this shouldn't be an exhaustive list. And there, some of these avenues may not prove fruitful, and that's okay. Um, so any, so, but that's satisfactory yep. Yep. to you? Yes, yes. Okay. And, the, and I really got the point that Jack made about the date. Yeah particularly because I didn't know before that we have the money in our Montpelier Energy Group for a consultant, you said. there was. We have there. the money, to be clear. The it starts July 1, the money does. Start, I got right, that. but we can, but we can, start we can strive to have it done by the end of 2020, and, and that's great. I'm not trying to be obstructive. I just don't know how long the planning process is going to take. We haven't hired a consultant. We don't know what their plan is. We don't know what work they're going to do. So I, that's our, you know. That's yeah. my concern, yeah. but I think to set that as a, you know, I guess the concern is we say this, and then on the first meeting in January, we've got a room full of people saying, you know, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. So I, yeah. and, and I mean that facetiously, not really, but, you know, we, I, I take, if we pass this, the commitment would be that we would start probably as soon as the budget passed, if it passes mm -hmm. in March, and then, you know, start prepping and doing the RFPs and all that stuff so we're ready to roll instead of starting that whole process in right. July. And that, you know, they'll tell us how long, you know, I, I, I don't have any idea what's involved in doing one of these so plans. If so they, if they find out a different date, then they come back to us and we amend it. And we can let us, at least or we, we just were consciously know doing it. Okay. That's the planning. The committee. Yes. I know. Okay. Um, uh, actually, this other lady um, wanted to say something um, before. If you would like to make another comment. I would just like to make a methodological, raise a methodological question because I, I mean, I've been, I've been studying this since 1971 when we cleaned up oil spills in California. Um, and um, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks watching the WEF uh, World Economic Forum sessions on the climate emergency. So one, the, the, the whole world right now is reeling over the latest scientific revelations which indicate that things are moving much faster than anybody thought. One of the reasons that happened, and I read a very interesting scientific paper on this, is that the scientists themselves were reluctant to come to the conclusion about what was actually happening until if, they had consensus. If you wouldn't mind speaking into the microphone oh, so sorry. that people at home I'm, can I'm hear you oh, also. Oh, Thank oh, you. I'm sorry. I th I'm, it's okay. I'm used to being on the stage. Anyway, so the scientists themselves, the, the key planetary scientists themselves uh, have, you know, revealed <laughs> that they were slow to come to the conclusion about what was happening. And one of the reasons for this had to do with the necessity for consensus consensus among scientists themselves before they told the rest of the planet what was going on. So I'm just, secondly, I think that, you know, I, I'm all for a plan. 
I, the plan needs to be in concert because we're a, a town that's trying to deal with town, what the town is about. But we also part of planet. And to my knowledge, very little weather comes out of Vermont to anywhere else. We get weather from everywhere that that delivers, uh, you know, it's like you're here and like what? Chicago's coming today, Maine's coming tomorrow, Alaska's coming the next day, so we're gonna, getting it. I'm gonna interrupt you because you're at about two And I'm minutes. gonna just stop now. Okay. <laughs> we I, hear what you. I'm, what I'm, re I'm, I'm willing to work on this, okay? Because I, I wanna, I, I, I'm willing to work on this. I'm gonna live here. I'm willing to do, to help, help and vision a consultative process so that the experts that you get on your on the advisory committee are dealing with what they need to deal with. Thank you. And I'm hats off to everybody um, to So there was a mention earlier that somehow this uh, whatever is done is in the bailiwick of MIAC, the Energy Committee. Um, I was informed at the last MIAC meeting when I tried to bring up the issue of resilience that really en the Energy Committee only deals with energy. I think we're facing something that actually has to do with the whole systems problem in the city, which includes infrastructure, includes systems, includes land planning, et cetera, that we are uh, missing it by putting things on the energy. Like I said, that horse is out of the barn, as she just said. What we're going to be experiencing is the effect of the carbon pollution put in in California, India, China, et cetera. What we do here is going to be minimal. What we are going to have to respond to is going to be huge. And so I would like to propose that the city consider a resilience committee, for lack of a better word, that would look at some of the issues of both land use, infrastructure, transportation, and uh, energy as a total picture as a way of addressing this. Because I think the Energy Committee has already said this is not their bailiwick. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any further comments on the resolution or is there a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, adopt the resolution endorsing the declaration of climate emergency and emergency mobilization effort to mitigate damage due to climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, as presented and as modified uh, by the mayor's suggestions in the third whereas clause and uh, I'll keep it as uh, a plan for the end of 2020. Second. There's a motion and a second. Um, I just want to look back there. Does that sound OK? OK. Um, further comments? OK. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? OK. Thank you all. And thank you so much for your uh, good work uh, on this. And um, I look forward to filling out some of the steps as to how we're going to uh, move towards energy independence, reducing our fossil fuel use. Deeply important. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, okay. So we are up to some appointments. So the first is to the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Uh, seems apropos, actually, right after the climate resolution. Uh, so for that, uh, we had uh, one vacant seat and one applicant from Peter Lux, um, who I do not see here, unless I'm missing Peter. Um, don't see Peter, but he also comes to the Energy Committee. Um, Jack. I move that we appoint Peter Lux to the MTIC. Second. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, all right. And we have an appointment to the Americans with Disabilities Commission. Uh, group that. Conservation. Conservation. Oh, I, I'm skipping stuff. It's not good. OK. <laughs> This page is not loading for me right now. So how many seats do we have? There's one um, vacant 
seat, which is Paige's, and she's she's in two alternates, and three people have applied. So there are also two vacant seats, right? Oh. Two vacant seats. There are two vacant seats, plus my term is up. Okay, then I'm not reading. Yeah, but I, so think it's, I think the two vacant seats are alternates. Is that right? Um, so I'd actually like to pause on this and actually do the ADA appointment okay. first because there's it's um, a little simpler because sure. I think there's multiple people for this and we actually have to make some decisions. Oh, okay. Um, about that um, because of the do we put someone in an alternate seat or vacant you know the um, regular appointment? So um, so going to the ADA committee, um, there was uh, one vacancy and there was one applicant, uh, Priscilla Fox. Is Priscilla here? Hello. If you wouldn't mind coming up and introducing yourself and uh, telling us about your interest in the ADA committee. Thank you. I'm Priscilla Fox. I live in Montpelier and I would like to volunteer for the city in some capacity and I think this is the best fit for me. I am a lawyer. I've had some experience with the ADA in my previous work. Great. So any, that's any basically questions? My, my reason. Great. Any questions for Priscilla? No, I'll just note, uh, it says that you actually lectured on a unit of the Rehabilitation Act, the predecessor to the ADA yes. as well. So I understand you're intimately familiar with both the ADA and its, its origins. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I would say intimately <laughs> familiar anymore. <laughs> but I did, um, yes, I taught that at Vermont Law School many years ago. Okay. It is, oh, I did yes, not go take ahead. advantage of yeah. that. Just one question. I'm on the uh, ADA committee. and. Uh, I should just mention that uh, this is a committee that typically meets uh, during the business day. So yes. if that's not a problem. No, just, that's not a problem okay, for great. me. Okay, great. Okay, um, uh, great. I'll make yeah, a Don. motion that we appoint Priscilla Fox to the ADA committee. I'll second. A further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so jumping back to the Conservation Commission, so I think there were f there were actually four um, vacancies, and because uh, Roy Schiff was not um, uh, renewing, um, and then there were already two alternate vacant gotcha. seats, uh, and then and pages. Sorry. Well, that's that's. Interesting, because his doesn't expire appointment too. isn't expired yet. But if he's not coming to he the meetings, okay. Yeah. Well, let's follow up about that. Probably need, yeah, we should get an official communication from the yeah commission to us about that, so we can okay. take an action okay. on that. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Well, let's. Well, we'll circle back to that one, uh, but thank you. Um, okay, so um, there uh, were four seats and uh, three folks to appoint. Um, Paige, you want to come introduce yourself? And I'm Paige Gurton, and I would like to ask that you reappoint me to the Conservation Commission. And I just found out today that um, we received the second grant that we applied for to do a walking tour of Vermont Green Infrastructure and finish the credit union sign. So I gotta be around to finish that up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Super. So you don't quit when it's done. <laughs> right. Uh, any questions for Paige? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, Joseph Whalen. Whalen. If you wouldn't mind coming up, introducing yourself, and tell us about your interest in the Conservation Commission. Um, <clears throat> I thought I would uh, do my part for the city of Montpelier by trying to help us keep this place green. <clears throat> I've got some background in environmental uh, subjects. I have a degree from Linden State, natural sciences. I think I should be able to recognize uh, a few plants and insects and trees around town and help to 
preserve them. Uh, I did serve on the uh, city council, uh, uh, a commission some years ago in recreation. And uh, I found it a pretty fulfilling experience and I hope that this will be as fulfilling. Great. Uh, Jack. Um, I, it might not have been clear that uh, some of the, that there was a multiple full uh, membership slots on the commission when you applied. So are you willing to be either an alternate or a full member? If for, I think I'd, what we I think I'd prefer starting as an alternate. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, Good. okay uh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great, thanks. Joe was also active on, in the group that attempted to keep recreation the out of Berlin Pond. Berlin Pond group, oh. he was very active. Okay. Yep. All right, and Stephanie Hunt. Stephanie here. Okay, um, so this is one we probably should go into executive session on, yeah. I move that we enter into executive session to discuss the appointment of a public officer or employee pursuant to 1 BSA section 313A3. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we will be. Okay. <laughs> All right, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I move uh, that we appoint Paige Girton and Stephanie Hunt to uh, permanent positions on the Conservation Commission and uh, Joseph Whalen to uh, position as uh, alternate. Second. Uh, and just to clarify, by, by permanent position, you mean the three-year term? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> you don't get to resign. <laughs> <laughs> but not the alternate. Commissioner for life. Yes. <laughs> some, okay. some of us have been on those commissions that uh, <laughs> seem to be in perpetuity. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Th thank you, uh, Paige and Joseph and, and Stephanie, uh, for your uh, commitment, your service. Okay, and so we have uh, one appointment to make to the Development Review Board. Uh, and there's, it says there's one vacancy, but it looks like there might be more. Regardless, we have one uh, applicant. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if Roger Krantz is here. I don't see him. Okay. okay. All right. Um, is there any? Um, no. I'll, I'll move to appoint Roger Krantz to the Development Review Board for oh. the uh, open three-year term. Second. Uh, oh, I was going to second it. I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. Apologize. <laughs> 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 So you're second. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> just, just to clarify. All right. Further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Great. Thank you. And thanks to Roger. Okay. So I think we are up to uh, the presentation of the downtown master plan. So. You know, there's some folks here who have a presentation for us. And just to clarify, we're not voting on anything about this tonight. This is just an No, update. and I'm, I think Mike can tee this up is that as well as I can. But yes, that is correct. This is a, an introduction of where, kind of a status update. They'll be back in March with an actual rec plan recommendation. But do we need the lights off? Yes. Um, uh, actually, it shows up pretty good once we, does it? Okay. Do you want a minute to set things up, or do you, yeah. is it? What time is it? It's only 7.30. Well, I'm going to, let's just keep rolling. It's only been an hour, so. I know. Just like. 
So I'm Mike Miller, the planning director, and so I just wanted to go and I'm quickly just going to tee this up for um, for these folks for um, look at that. Oh, I like like that. he knows what he's doing. I was in the AV club in high school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as everyone's aware, we've been working on the downtown uh, streetscape plan for a number of months now, and uh, SE Group has been doing a great job at putting these ideas together and um, doing a lot of public input. And they've got a quick presentation that th there's no decision to be made tonight. This is really uh, taking everything that was learned and compiling a recommendation for you to start to think about and consider and then kind of hear from you what path you want to take. We understand with you know, an election coming up in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a, a, maybe some new faces on the council, so we didn't want to try to rush in and get a decision before then, but we wanted to get you guys the opportunity for you to comment, for anyone who's not going to be here next month, uh, you'll have an opportunity to give us your thoughts of what you see, and um, for anyone who's new coming on, they'll have the same opportunity. So we'll give them a, a couple minutes here maybe 15 minutes to go through an explanation of, of what they've come up with, and we'll just take some comments and any public input as well. So by way of introduction, I'm Mark Kane, Director of Community Planning and Design for SE Group, and I'm joined today by uh, Patrick Olstead, our Project Manager and Senior Landscape Architect. Um, the presentation today is going to kind of cover uh, some of the high points of the draft uh, master plan document that I believe this council has received. Um, and I'll start off by talking about the fact that this downtown master plan is actually a core master plan. The study area that's depicted in that sort of light tan color is uh, a subset of the actual urban fabric of Montpelier. Um, and that's an important consideration as we get into some of the recommendations because as you will see, um, there are recommendations in this plan related to land use and stormwater and some other things, and they are constrained by the study area, but we recognize the city's pursuing broader strategies elsewhere. Um, so the study area encompasses, uh, the, the, the main streets the study area encompasses are State Street, Main Street, Berry Street, and uh, Langdon Street, with a, with a touch of Elm uh, uh, and Court Street on the sides. Um, Patrick, why don't you walk them through the, uh, the sort of the, the structure of the plan in terms of the, the streets we looked at? Yeah, um, well, I think the first thing you might want to do is kind of um, talk about sort of the high level stuff that we looked at. Um, we looked at the whole downtown course, pretty high level in terms of opportunities. Um, so you just, yeah, we can go back to that. Um, go actually go advance too. So in terms of our analysis, looking at the opportunities uh, in the downtown core. Um, you know, one of the key things that was important was looking at the kind of bike ped um, connectivity and opportunities. So we were really um, kind of building off some of the previous studies as a starting point for our work and then looking at other opportunities to, to kind of in, improve the connectivity, um, you know, take advantage of the, uh, the amazing bike path that's in there now and really try to make it easier fo for folks to get there from a number, number of different locations, whether on bike or, or walking. Um, so this is, this is one plan that we did that kind of just kind of summarize that high level, uh, looking at you know, potentially closing some alleys, making things a little more pedestrian friendly, safer for people on bikes, also investing in more infrastructure to kind of intercept people who are coming into the downtown on their bikes so they can park and then walk because it's an incredibly walkable downtown and just wanted to make sure that that was um, shown at those key locations. Um, the next plan, we also looked at infill opportunities. Uh, we also looked at open space opportunities. And in some cases, we looked at some of the parcels where we might suggest it could be one or the other. Um, you know, one of the, one of the issues that we've heard is that there's a need for housing downtown. Um, there's also the parking issue, clearly. Um, so we looked at, um, you know, some of those opportunities, whether it be kind of an underutilized lot or uh, maybe a parking lot that, you know, could have a higher and better use at, at some point. You know, really, there's pretty limited real estate, but we wanted to uh, just kind of see what, what, could be, what could be done in the downtown core to address some of these infill uh, opportunities. Um, let's see. And I should point out that this, all of these studies do kind of make the assumption 
that the proposed parking garage hotel development is going to happen and that's just kind of reflected in our plans as sort of a basis uh, for, for our planning. So this looks at open space. Uh, I think this ties into some of the discussion we heard earlier tonight. Um, trying to restore a riparian buffer for the river. You know, Montpelier is similar to many other uh, urban downtown environments um, that where, you know, development goes right up to the river's edge. Ideally, you'd have a little bit more of a natural kind of edge there that would provide, uh, you know, habitat. It's going to provide more stomp stormwater kind of treatment opportunities and also provides a open space recreational um, environment for people yeah thank you microphone <laughs> one thing that I think is really important to recognize in the in the community engagement was that the in the core we're dealing with here there actually is a lack of civic open space um, you obviously have the little plaza out here in front of City Hall but there's really not a lot so one of the opportunities that exists is to take advantage of maybe some of this riparian restoration and some of those in those underdeveloped properties and actually expand open space with a civic mindedness to it and we think that might be a very interesting uh, opportunity to explore yeah thanks Mark. I think I think that's one of the things where if you can find that alignment of achieving multiple goals whether it be improved stormwater quality or water quality civic open space um, and, you know, and habitat and things like that. That's, that's really those opportunities where we wanted to, to look at. So related to that is the stormwater. So this shows again that riparian corridor. We also looked at, you know, uh, this is again, I oh, should tee up, we had with our team, Watershed Consulting, who really specializes in stormwater management. And they looked at the stormwater, improved water quality opportunities through a number of different um, recommendations. And so this kind of tries to capture some of those possibilities um, kind of a high level way, but I think one of the key things to understand in Montpelier is that infiltration is, is kind of limited in terms of an opportunity due to the soils. You have heavier soils here that don't drain as quickly as, as maybe you would like to make infiltration a major practice for stormwater. Um, so we would be looking at some opportunities for that. But a lot of it would be looking at capturing um, water, getting into subsurface uh, detention, and then filtration. Uh, so, and some of these practices could be very much integrated into the streetscape recommendations we're making in terms of tree plantings, where you could have um, those planters serve as filtration to remove phosphorus. And uh, just another point on that that I think is really important is the fact that, again, that's this strategies that we're talking about are related to this study area in this core. Obviously, there are other strategies that would be applicable elsewhere in the city, and obviously. What the hope is is that uh, the recommendations from the plan and, the, mo and the, the modeling that was actually done associated with this plan would be informative to the city as it looks at its stormwater management treatment more broadly. So this is where we get into um, more specifics on the streetscape itself. Um, and, and what we did was, we, you know, we went through this public process. We uh, went to, you know, had a couple farmers market events. Uh, we had an online survey. We wanted to try to get a sense of what people's priorities are for the streetscape because you only have so much area to deal with. Uh, is it going to go to cars? Is it going to go to parking? Is it going to be for green infrastructure and trees? Uh, is it pedestrian space? Um, are there, you know, kind of opportunities for outdoor dining and seating? And so there's all these kind of compete, competing interests, and we wanted to see how we could uh, bring those together and find kind of the ideal balance. And the way we explored this was through two, you know, kind of distinct concepts, uh, concept A and concept B. Uh, I think, and let me just first say that both of them are trying to find, you know, make improvements to the pedestrian uh, kind of uh, environment in the downtown, improve the bikeability to the downtown, get more trees in the downtown environment. So I think as a baseline, we wanted to do all of that. And then we just kind of shifted the priority a little bit to one or more of these um, focuses on, on each of the concepts. So with concept A, um, I'd say this one, the, the kind of biggest focus for this is on placemaking. Um, really trying to maybe go a little bit beyond the kind of typical uh, business as usual, um, creating some really special places uh, through enhancing the streetscape, and in some cases kind of blurring the line between the street and the sidewalk. Um, maybe, you know, looking at options of kind of having a uh, 
flush condition where you you bring that uh, kind of enhanced pavement across the sidewalk into the road. This is in front of uh, City Hall here where we're looking at kind of maybe an enhanced um, plaza space that could be opened up a little bit, become a more important and kind of uh, functional civic space. And then that could then kind of carry through through the street to really give that, that building the importance of what happens to that building a, sort of a grander sort of feel in front of it. And then as a general sort of concept in the streetscape, we really wanted to emphasize creating an environment that would be good for growing really large, healthy trees. And uh, having those trees have enough space to grow with bigger planters um, and, and having them a little further from the street. Uh, let's see, go to the next one. You can see how this played out in State Street. Again, the idea of kind of creating this enhanced pavement that could um, carry across the street at the Rialto Bridge. Um, and that's you know, up for reconstruction, as you know. So that's an exciting opportunity to do something kind of special there. Uh, you know, and, and, and this is looking at the idea of like maybe you could do some kind of shade structure, get more seating out there, and really draw attention to that kind of important interface between the streetscape and the river that's right there. Uh, and you can see one of those larger tree beds in the <coughs> foreground of that perspective sketch. And that gives you an opportunity to do some understory kind of colorful plantings um, to kind of bring more vibrancy to the street. Langdon Street, uh, for option A, uh, we explored some, um, kind of, again, kind of interesting ideas of uh, blurring the line between the street and the sidewalk. Uh, looked at here at Flush Curb throughout the whole um, street. It has, you know, it's, a, I think, a distinct kind of character as it is, Langdon Street, compared to the rest of the downtown, based on the kind of the scale and, and kind of width of the street. Uh, so we were kind of proposing here the idea of some kind of special pavement um, surfacing that could span across um, the entire corridor. Uh, maybe some, um, uh, let's see, eliminating one row of parking on the north side of the street to free up more sidewalk space because it's pretty tight through there. And then the idea here is that you could close the street uh, and use it for festivals and special events and it could just have its own kind of special character. Uh, and we didn't, you know, to carry that level of detail through every every foot of the downtown core, but wanted to kind of capture the overall concept and what it would mean in terms of parking or parking loss. So this is kind of a diagram that captures all of that in terms of <coughs> what the street tree kind of strategy is and what the parking strategy would be. So you see some areas uh, where we are indicating a loss of parking, some areas where uh, would remain to be parallel parking, and then some cases where you might be able to um, add some parking back in through angled parking. So the big idea with A essentially is to is to introduce uh, you know maybe uh, less numbers of trees, but more space, more volume for trees. And the idea that was mentioned earlier in discussion about some climate strategies that soil volume may become more valuable for carbon retention, so sequestration, for example. It also may also allow us to pick trees that actually have a bigger canopy. And one of the challenges right now in many urban environments is having very shallow, narrow uh, bands in which, which to plant trees, and that limits greatly the species composition you could use. So the idea, one of the, that's one of the big ideas that A. The other big idea, as you saw, was this idea of blurring the lines between the pedestrian space and the vehicular space. This idea of, of <clears throat> tabling some of the streets to allow for more flow of people. And that, is, that may be a very good long-term strategy for the city because that is a situation where as the needs for cars changes, as the needs for transit changes, as the city comes to terms with a new future in terms of, of, of mobility, it can claim more of that space for pedestrians in a more adaptive way. When you have hard curb lines, that's a much more challenging situation. So there's a lot of value potentially in looking at curbless streets in select areas, as we were recommending, um, to allow you to adapt as the, the world around us changes. So in terms of concept B, uh, again, some of the same overall kind of high level priorities, um, getting more trees on there, improving the pedestrian experience. Um, I think one of the key distinctive uh, factor or, or elements of this plan is the idea of incorporating um, grade separated bike lanes on Main Street and that so that's what came out of that um, 
uh, Berrien main scoping study. We pretty much followed that as a guideline for this concept. Um, and, and so when we were developing these concepts, uh, just going back to concept A, we realized that that sort of, uh, you know, that is an opportunity cost in terms of the pedestrian and tree environment to, to put in that dedicated bike infrastructure uh, on Main Street. And so, and A, we did look at, you know, what if, what if we just kept bikes on, on the road on Main Street with just sharrows and maybe some traffic calming, and then looked at some locations off of Main to provide that important north-south um, circulation to, to get to the bike path and, and create that larger connectivity beyond the downtown core. And so with A, we would, would look at the option of Elm Street really being serving that function with a cycle track and then having connectivity crossing State Street uh, past the existing, or uh, sorry, the proposed uh, parking garage and making its way down to the, to the bike path from there. So, but we wanted to look at what this looked like in terms of character and what, it, what you know, kind of how that would feel to, to have those, to have the dedicated bike lanes. Um, there's also, I think in general, just because we are giving a little more room to the bike lanes, and in this case, uh, maintaining more on-street parking, this is a view of State Street, it meant that we have less space for the trees, and so we're, we're looking at tree grates um, in, in option B throughout, throughout the area, uh, just because they take up, you know, kind of less, less the impact the sidewalk less and allow you to kind of walk, walk right across the surface of them. Um, so for, for concept B for Langdon Street, uh, we did not carry that special pavement across, across the street, but we did in this one um, create a wider sidewalk for the north side and, and we're able to achieve that again by eliminating, eliminating a row of parking. So again, this one's a little bit more, a little less outside the box. And then we captured all that, what it meant in terms of parking on uh, concept B. And it's interesting because even though we had more of an emphasis on maintaining on-street parking in concept B, it actually ended up working out fairly even because we were able to have a little more angled parking on the north stretch of Main Street with concept A. So in terms of our recommendations, I'll put this one back to Mark. Uh, this is this is talking about kind of land use strategy. Yeah. So you know, as we mentioned, I think the, the, the you know the land use opportunity that exists is to sort of reclaim the riparian zone, and that this is something that's already codified within the city regulations. It's already <coughs> there. I think the commitment will be in in executing on it ultimately, and also prioritizing it in terms of its strategy. Um, but the the couple key things that we sort of uh, thought would be relevant to this conversation would be, you know, making sure that there's a wider green corridor for sure, um, making sure that we have adequate parking, and, and if that parking is 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 at the rear of some of those buildings, which it is today largely, um, making sure there's ways to get to it, and that's really critical. And I think there's some there's some un, unutilized un, underutilized lots on Main Street, for example, that provide some connectivity to Jacobs lot behind. Maintaining some level of connectivity to those areas is going to be critical if they, if they redevelop, if, they, if there's an infill opportunity there. But the real, the real big sort of, sort of uh, major objective here is to connect the river to um, the people. Make sure that the, the, the civic space, the public realm, the streetscape is actually in some meaningful way connected back to the river. Because that appreciation for the river, that the understanding of that the river is an important part of the community, that openness to it, the visibility of it, provides a, a more direct connection between people and, and that environmental resource. And we feel like that would be a great opportunity to make sure people don't realize it's just not out of, out of sight, out of mind. It's actually integrated within the city. Yes, in, a, in a analyzing uh, concept A and concept B, we went through this kind of um, methodical approach to tracking what we really thought were the important goals. And so we, we developed these ev evaluation criteria and then rated them. And uh, basically, it, it looked like concept A in, in most ways was coming out on top. Uh, there, you know, there's some that were similar, uh, maybe one construction cost was <laughs> maybe a little bit more favorable for option B. Uh, but this was an important way to like make sure we were really just being objective about it. and. Um, and we have more detail in the report that talks about each of these particular criteria and, and why, why it got that rating. 
So in terms of our final recommendations, uh, in general, option A is what we're recommending. We've got more support from the public um, from that, for that option. And it's, you know, really it has a, a kind of more elevated uh, placemaking component to it. Uh, we did ultimately recommend a bit of a hybrid in that um, there is a kind of a chunk of, of option B that we thought might make sense, and that's on State Street between the Rialto Bridge and Main Street where you could create an improved pedestrian environment. You've got enough area to work with to kind of narrow the current roadway and, um, and maintain on-street parking. So they're sort of trying to factor in, you know, a balance of competing interests and, you know, the, wanting the business owners, you know, to have you know, co comfort in, in, in the amount of kind of convenient parking, but also making sure we're addressing the needs to improve the pedestrian environment and create more real meaningful green space as well. Uh, we are kind of maintaining this recommendation of a really enhanced and special treatment for the Rialto Bridge. Um, I was going to say something else, but I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that kind of encapsulates. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, I think in terms of, like Mark mentioned, flexibility, uh, you know, as, as the need for parking here might lessen over time, you do still have the opportunity to continue with the use of um, these parklets. And I think that's a really creative and flexible way to capture some of that street space and make it usable for outdoor dining, and seating, things like that. Uh, we did also just kind of make some basic recommendations in terms of the materials and furnishings. This is mainly kind of giving a sense of what we think the character of that should be, given this is a historic downtown, but also some discussion of kind of durability of these different uh, materials and some of the environmental benefits you'd have from things like permeable pavers. Uh, so this is kind of a little snapshot of what we think is kind of the vision uh, for that kind of look and feel as you get to more of that, that detailed level. And this captures the, the hybrid approach to the um, overall streetscape in terms of the tree, tree treatment and parking. So on, on balance, there's relatively little loss. Could you use the microphone, please? Sorry. On balance, there's relatively little loss overall of parking with the presumption that the parking garage is constructed and that, that the streetscape had, can benefit from some access to spaces in that parking garage. We also discuss a number of other potential uh, strategies to help with the parking situation, and those are all outlined in there. And a lot of that's drawn upon um, a previous parking study that was done. We also have Stantec Consulting on our team, and they're uh, traffic engineers and civil engineers, and they, they've provided their, their guidance for that, as well as all of our uh, vehicular and bike pad kind of recommendations. We've had just this very multidisciplinary approach to this project. And um, going back to the Elm Street, one other thing on that is to make that cycle track concept work, you need to go to one-way traffic for that block. That would be proposed as heading um, south. Um, and then to address some of the issues with um, traffic safety and pedestrian safety at that intersection, there'd be a no left turn um, from Elm Street onto State Street. Mark, do you want to speak to the implementation? Yeah, I mean, as is, as is customary with a project like this, there's some consideration of how would you go about doing it. And, and we tried to break this, uh, these different street segments down um, into some smaller bits because, quite frankly, you're going to, you're going to want to do that to maintain uh, the you know, functionality of the streets and the interim and, and businesses and all of that. Um, there are obviously costs associated with all of these things, but I think, and there's process ahead. I think the, the you know, the really important detailed design work would come as um, as each one of these segments is moved forward. Um, but I think the, you know, the couple of key things that I think are really important that the implementation matrix sort of discusses is that the expectation is, is that some of the stormwater strategies that are, are articulated in the plan would be done commensurate with some of these streetscape improvements. So that, again, it's a, it's, you're building this, um, system of solutions that deal with the placemaking elements, the pedestrian elements, the bike elements, and the stormwater management elements. So that's really critical. Um, the other thing is, is that, in, and we've spoken with Public Works throughout this project, is that there's also, as, as was mentioned earlier, obviously existing infrastructure issues that the city's dealing with, and it, it would be advisable to consider what those <clears throat> projects are and aligning them with particular streetscape improvements. 
so that you're taking advantage of the disruption and the mobilization associated with that. And then the other thing I think that's really important is to, is to sort of stress is that for any of these projects, most of these projects, there is going to have to be a public-private uh, interaction. Um, you know, obviously, some of those open spaces that were identified as potential options are, are open spaces that may exist or partially exist on private land. And it's clearly um, not the city's ability to just do what they want with that, but to work in, in, in a partnership with those private landowners with a strategic vision to help guide um, those interactions. And then we, that's what we see this as a sort of helping to do. The good news is, uh, you know, I think the, and this, obviously the city's already explored this to some degree with its the scoping study, previous scoping study, is that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of this that probably can be done in the relatively near term. Um, you know, obviously with, with caveats and uh, the logistics associated with that. But a lot of what we're talking about, the scale of this downtown, as Patrick said, is really walkable. So you have the benefit of not being overly large. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, a, a small improvement on State Street, for example, would make a very disproportionate impact on the character of your downtown. So that's actually a very positive thing. Um, the other thing I would just sort of acknowledge in the, in the just to kind of summarize this through port a little bit more, there's a, there's, a, there's a significant, one of the things that we pitched to the city when we proposed on this project was this modeling exercise that Watershed did to understand the water quality benefits of potentially some of these options. And uh, as you'll see in the study, there are obviously some similarities. There's pretty close uh, alignment in some of those options in terms of the water quality improvements. But it, we think it provides an interesting model for the city to consider as it's, as it's refining these, uh, these opportunities in the future to kind of go back to that modeling and say, okay, how is it, how is it evolving? Are we actually um, achieving some of these objectives that the modeling suggests we can achieve in terms of phosphorus reduction, for example, or the retention of stormwater. So there's some really good things, I think, that the, as a strategic document, it puts into place things that you can use in the city's plan update, for example, or as you have your continued conversations around stormwater, or as I was mentioning to Michael earlier, um, in some ways, this fills the donut hole that your complete streets guide, which didn't really cover this part of the city, does. It provides a little bit of a, a more clarity as to maybe what the direction could be. And with that, we conclude our formal remarks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys get it. Yes. So I think this is really an opportunity for us and the public to just check in. Um, we're headed in the right direction. Um, what feedback do we have at this point? So comments from council. I have a lot of comments. Yes. <laughs> so, first off, I thought that was excellent. Thanks so much. It was very easy to digest. And uh, you know, I think we have a lot to look forward to if some of this is implemented. Uh, not, not to be the doomsday guy, but if the garage is not built, yeah. is my math correct that this plan would anticipate between 31 and 47 less parking spots downtown? Than we have currently? That's probably about right. Okay. The hybrid plan is a little bit less than that. Okay. It's got to be right on the number. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I have, I have lots of thoughts here. Okay. Um, I, th so this feels to me like a good start. There are questions that I am hoping that this plan will answer for us that uh, I, I don't feel like there's good. I just want to make sure that you're aware that these are some of the expectations that I have um, for this. Um, one is I think we need specific guidance on what do we do with the TKS property. Right? What, is the, what is the need um, there? Is it for office space or is it for um, uh, more green space. And, um, you know, if, if the recommendation is like that, yes, that should be included in the riparian buffer, great, like, but just be really clear about that space because we have to make a decision. Um, so that's one thing. Um, this is, I'm, I'm doing this in no particular order, mm -hmm. by the way. I think it was a little weird the way the document was attached or, or uploaded somehow uh, because the uh, appendices were at the beginning. And so that was, 
to read that first? <laughs> yes, to write all the appendices oh, yeah. first. Um, and actually, to that point, if you're going to include those appendices, um, there are a whole bunch of graphs in there that are bar graphs that have no labels, and I don't know what they mean. Um, so, yeah, they, it was you know what to do about Langdon Street and Main Street, and there were uh, x and y axes that had no labels, and I was like, what is happening? Um, so that's that's a not terribly substantive um, point. Um, for Langdon Street, I sort of half expected there to be at least the consideration of like, what if it was just, what if it was just a, a walking plaza? What if it was closed to cars? Mm -hmm. I mean, Church Street is closed to cars, but cars still go on it to make deliveries and stuff, which would understandably be necessary. Um, Can I talk to you? Yes, please. Yeah. So you know, the idea, as, as Pepper was just describing, the festival street idea. Yeah. Can you go out and use the microphone? That's not working. Sorry. As Patrick was describing, you know, in concept A, the idea, and, and B to some degree, but A certainly, the idea of turning it into more of a festival street, getting rid of curves, making it feel more pedestrian, <laughs> you know, that is the recommendation for Langdon Street. Um, you know, whether the city wants to permanently close that, the, the design wouldn't necessarily need to change. Our office is actually on Church Street. We did the Church Street Marketplace project. Oh, nice. yeah. um, so <laughs> quite familiar with the rankling that went across at the Rusty Scuffer um, <laughs> next door. Um, but the idea is that it would still have to provide access. There's going to be access for service. There's going to be access for fire. There's going to be access for public works. There's going to need to maintain some vehicular access to Langdon Street. So removable bollards, for example are an easy design fix that would allow the city to manage and control the flow of vehicles within Lincoln Street. And Thank it would you. fit the design really well. So if, so, so um, it would make sense to me then if, if it's okay with you, if you could address that specifically in the report, even if it's to say that that is a policy decision that we are not recommending, but this structure allows for that possibility. Sure. That would that would be helpful, just because I'm. This is a conversation that has been going on for a long time, and so for it to be specifically addressed, I think would be valuable. So I think there's also a little bit of a conversation. Um, can you also? Or, or can people hear? Okay. Oh, so this one isn't working. I don't know. Say, say a little more. Right, is this one working? Yeah, yeah, just that one. Yeah. All right. Well, that explains it. <laughs> All right. So um, the other consideration that SE Group was given when when we started this process was that we weren't proposing to um, reduce the amount of parking downtown. Um, so if if we had a decision that said we're going to take all the on street parking off, then we would have to come up with a proposal that would go and say, but we're going to build a new, another parking structure over here to replace that parking. Just as a part of the, the policy of what they're working on. So part of removing the rest of the cars on Langdon Street would then put us in a position where we're going to be deficient in parking and have to replace it somewhere else. So it's, it could certainly be, be re-accommodated in another way, but that was just part of the conversation. So sometimes removing everything, you know, in an ideal world, you might be able to come in and pull it all off. But where do they, where does somebody who wants to go to Bookspieler mm -hmm. Park so if there's no parking and that could also get at the same point that you all are making about like this isn't a policy document necessarily it's about structure and um, right and design. I think it, yeah. it, it, it's, it's it's a design you know solution that's <coughs> that's policy ready <laughs> if you decide to do what you want to do in terms of closing off Langdon okay. Street the design is malleable enough to address that okay yeah what one other thing on that I mean I think we did talk about it um, with uh, Stantec while we're out there. And, and I guess one concern is it's not just the on-street parking. There's also parking areas for the businesses there. Mm -hmm. So it has kind of a bigger impact mm -hmm. um, as well. But okay. I think we, we, we love pedestrian-only yeah. <laughs> streets. Yeah. So yeah. if it could happen, that'd be great. But, okay. yeah. is, and it, I assume it pertains to this. Yes. <clears throat> Dan Groberg from Montpelier Life. Um, I'll just add that uh, one advantage of the really flexible streetscape design um, is that it allows for seasonal changes. So we may consider Langdon Street being pedestrian only in the summer when we have a lot of pedestrians out and about, but in the winter have more proximate parking when it's cold and people don't want to walk as far. Um, and that streetscape design allows for that kind of flexibility. Um, so I think that's really an exciting option. Cool. Thank you.
I agree. <laughs> um, and Elizabeth, did you have something you want to add on this particular point? Or no, okay, um, I'm going to keep going with my. Sure. Did you have something to add on this particular point? Uh, yes. Okay. So yeah. Um, oh, my name is David Papirski. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, the weather is very different um, in the winter uh, compared to the summer, and I realize this. Um, um, it's kind of based on the, the future parking garage, um, but and in a way, Montpelier is, is already there uh, with the uh, farmers market. Um, um, State Street is already closed down, um, so the idea is um, after everyone goes home from the state house Monday through Friday, um, there's going to be empty parking garage, so people can park there. <coughs> close down the city and it'll be more pedestrian and, and um, bike friendly. Um, but that once again is, you know, dependent upon, um, you know, change in, in weather. And I think it's it's great that um, uh, these three gentlemen were, were discussing um, about, um, you know, uh, environmental concerns and the river, um, as we were just discussing before this uh, the climate uh, declaration. So I think we should uh, also keep that in mind when we're uh, planning uh, what the uh, future uh, downtown area of, of uh, Montpelier is going to be. And um, uh, so, you know, cars are always a problem, but then, you know, if you close down the, the city streets, then there's always, you know, um, public transportation from uh, Department of Employment and uh, or um, Unemployment Department, whatever it's called, um, shuttle people back and forth um, to uh, the downtown area. So, thank you. And it's on this particular topic. Yeah, yes. The, yeah. On the specific yeah. hygiene Leon District Three, on the Langdon Street study, uh, was there a consideration on the dance studio that's there? So, if you close, I, I like the proposal of take removing one of the parking yeah. lanes, but there's a a lot of parents throughout the year that just drop off their kids, come and go, and there's, and I'm one of those parents. Um, every Friday, and there's a lot of kids in these classes. So we're not necessarily looking to park, we're just, you know, just drop off, pick up. And that, I've noticed at various times, that happens a lot on Langdon Street, so. Yeah. It's, uh, it'd be tough to just close it off. Yeah, you I mean, know, that we did. And then remove, and, you know, so. Yeah, Mace. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, so I mean, we did in both schemes maintain parking on one side of the street. And I think as a general recommendation, if we are losing on street parking, the idea of having more kind of pull off spaces for temporary parking, if you need to do a quick run into a store or something, I think is a great idea. So we, we do appreciate that, that um, sentiment. Yeah. So my next thing might have been addressed because if this is not really addressing um, policy. I mean, I, something that we've talked about for a really long time, and I, you know, it might be yet another long time before we do it, um, is to thinking about reverse angle parking. Uh, and I mean, mm. just as we brought up um, angled parking yeah. here, um, I don't know if that's, I assume that's sort of outside of the scope of the things that you would recommend or not, well, but. No, I mean, it's not. I mean, we, we did um, talk about that uh, for that upper stretch of Main Street where, it looked like you could maintain angled parking for a lot of it, especially with um, if you didn't have the dedicated bike lanes. Mm -hmm. So reverse angled parking is something that we've considered. I mean, I think um, there's you know some concern that it's just a little bit confusing. You know, that's that's the yes. that's the challenge of it, right? Um, it's definitely um, safer, but there's a little bit of a learning curve yeah. to it. So yeah. I think we would keep that you know as a possibility. Sure. Okay. Well, and again, if that affects the structure and the angles of, of anything, I suppose. Okay. Well, wait, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. But reverse angle park, I mean, have there been studies about how that works in winter? In, I mean, there have, been studies, there, there have been studies about its effectiveness in winter. It's the safety issue, as Patrick mentioned. Right. I mean, it technically is safer. Um, and I don't, from a structural perspective, from a design perspective, what's being shown can accommodate that if that's the policy it's decision. A it's just, yeah, it's a striping thing. It's not a big issue. Right. I think the question would be, um, and it's kind of a broader question, maintenance in general. If you're not maintaining your parking right. spaces, then it's a problem. 
Right. It, it just, I mean, I've done the reverse angle parking and it, you know, looking at the normal angle parking and the difficulty we have in winter um, in demarcating the spaces yeah. and getting people to park, I could see. Yeah. And, and I just wondered if other uh, We have an communities office in Colorado and Denver near, you know, we go to Denver all the time and, and there's a lot of reverse angle parking in Denver mm -hmm. and, and when they have their periodic snowstorms, it's a challenge mm -hmm. for sure. Well, the, perhaps a future conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you mentioned po the possibility of having permeable pavers. Um, very interested in that. I'm also, I, I feel conflicted about it because I both dearly want them to work <laughs> and I also am skeptical about their efficacy or their really their durability in um, this climate yeah and so I've always kind of wondered like okay so I know that there are places in Europe that do this and they have free yeah. cycles and what are they what are they doing and um, so I don't know if you have specific recommendations about that but yeah um, does it matter like what's underneath them what can you say about that yeah <clears throat> well I guess first of all I, I would just say that it's becoming more mainstream, and uh, we've worked now on a couple projects that include it uh, downtown um, in South Burlington in the new city center. That has a band of permeable pavers, and those are clay brick pavers that are very durable and resistant to salt damage. And basically, you just have a very deep um, crushed aggregate base supporting the bricks. They have little nubs that kind of keep that space between them and allows that water to go through. So. You know, I think we feel confident that it's a reliable um, method. There is a little bit of maintenance that you have to periodically kind of clear out the the, the joints and make sure that it's flowing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's other permeable paver uh, applications that have been less reliable, like permeable concrete, for example, which is a, con a poured in place concrete that has larger pores that allows the water to go through. And that has been susceptible to lots of spalling from salts and is not as reliable. But the pavers, in particular, clay brick pavers, I think are, you can, are, are solid. <laughs> um. With the necessity to clean them out, uh, it would yeah. be not for right now, but it'd be good uh, to include any information about what kind of time commitment that sure. would would be, so that we have an understanding of the ongoing sort of maintenance of that. Yeah. So we can be planning for that. You can add that. Yep. Um, and then I just want to point out. I mean, I I am psyched to see the riparian buffer in their uh, recognizing that that's mostly on private property. Yeah. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm clear about this point, that if we ended up adopting a plan that had a riparian um, buffer as proposed, that that, that that as itself would not constitute a taking. But if it were adopted into the city plan, that it might. Is that what, what can you tell me about um, what would constitute a taking in that um, situation? I'll only if it gets into the to the zoning where there's a certain requirement and you you can still do it without it being a taking it just has to be the riparian buffer will not be the taking it's the public access that becomes the taking now because something like say the jacobs lot is already public mm -hmm. then it's just a matter of i think negotiating the details that are within that lease agreement that says you have to maintain a certain number of parking spaces, but Bill knows that right. agreement much better than I do. Okay. So if it makes it into the zoning, and if it restricts public access? Or if it requires public require access, public. We, okay. Cannot, okay. we cannot give public access to private property Got without you. just compensation. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Sorry, those, maybe those, uh, well, anyway. No, there's a lot of questions. Really question. Thank you. Um, uh, Glenn. Um, just a thing or two. This is great and I love it uh, in general. Um, I wanted to highlight one thing that I liked in particular from one of the very first slides, the pedestrian opportunities. Um, uh, the uh, north-south access uh, between streets that are not currently easily connected by uh, pedestrian routes. Um, like Diane, who was talking earlier about the uh, climate emergency declaration, I am car free, um, and I walk all over town all the time. And uh, those little green paths uh, on the right side of Main Street um, make me very happy to think nice. about. Um, and I'm looking forward to something like that. Um, 
just uh, if I can make a point about that, um, when we when we did our initial walk around um, right here in the Blanchard lot, that was kind of one of the first uh, things, that, ideas that kind of popped out because it clearly is a remnant grid that has been lost. And I think that going back to the sort of the overarching strategy that's sort of exemplified by this opportunities plan, it's sort of reconstructing the grid a little bit, but with a de-emphasis on cars and an emphasis on pedestrians. And I think that's a really kind of a, it could be a very innovative strategy for the city because that north-south connectivity is one of the biggest sort of drawbacks. And having some mid-block, you know, pedestrian accessibility opens up you know, other routes for people to get in and out. Back to the bike strategy, it's another way of capturing people on the intercepting them on the periphery of this core to park and walk in, in their downtown environment so that they're, they're comfortable and the bike's in a safe pot and they can get where they need to go. And it also provides, hopefully, as the, as the infill opportunities happen, like with this, on this, uh, the Court Street property, if that ever builds into a parking garage, for example, or something else, that pedestrian connectivity being established would, would enable it to function more integratedly into the downtown core. I apologize, I have two more. But <laughs> Jack, you can go before me. <laughs> I, I think there's a, there's a lot to like here. Um, I'm, I'm kind of with Ann you know, on the pavers and you know, kind of skeptical about that. You know, my my father-in-law spent his whole professional life as a municipal engineer doing roads and stuff and he was up visiting one time and we saw the pavers in front of city center building and his reaction was, yep, yeah, architectures really love uh, pavers, engineers hate them because <laughs> So I guess landscape architects are agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, they screw up the plows and they do all this stuff. And so I just yeah. need to be convinced about that probably. I'm, uh, do, do you want to respond to that well, right now? Well, no, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I understand your concerns. I mean, I would recommend talking to South Burlington and Burlington, because Burlington just put in permanent pavers on St. Paul Street, too. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the first phase of their Great Streets project. That includes a lot of stormwater, kind of innovative stormwater management integrated into the streetscape, permeable pavers, and, and they, they're using concrete pavers. South Burlington is using clay brick pavers. Um, so I, I would recommend, I mean, it, it's, it's newly installed, so, you know, see how, see how it deals over time, but I think it'll be worth talking to them and seeing what their experience okay, is. Thanks. Um, I, I'm a bit concerned about, and I probably need to be convinced and concerned about the safety of the uh, of the zero curb uh, concept because yeah. you know I just picture you know a curb is one of the things that really tells pedestrians that they're on the sidewalk or they're on the street and right. uh, we already have some issues with people uh, heedlessly stepping into the street or being uh, uh, getting hit by cars right a um, few things on that. I mean, I think for all those areas where we're proposing that, you would have <clears throat> a detectable warning strip that identifies the edge of the pedestrian zone. So if anyone's visually impaired, they would know that they're then crossing into the street. I think it's even for non-visually impaired people, it would be a visual kind of marker of that edge. We also are showing bollards in a lot of those locations. That would be another visual mm -hmm. kind of marker for that. Um, I think in terms of nighttime, you'd want to have make sure you have really good lighting in those locations. So I think a lot of those concerns can be addressed um, through the design. And one of the other aspects of the concept day was the raised planters. So mm -hmm. one of the benefits of actually having those raised planters there is they actually create some of that edge as well. Uh -huh. So as, as opposed to graded graded trees. And then one last thing that I want to say. Were you going to follow up on what oh, I'm saying? Only here, just to that thing about the curbless, yeah, if I could. Because, um, again, as a, and this is going to be just anecdotal, but as a pedestrian, the curbless streets tend to feel safer to me uh, in a certain way because um, they, they tend to be limited. They tend to be short, and uh, it, it's, it's always been very well visually signaled so that drivers and pedestrians understand that this is a shared space, everyone goes slowly. I think the other thing um, that occurs to me is that in a, a lot of the dangerous behavior I see of pedestrians crossing uh, feels like it's um, crossing at odd spots where there are not Marks. crosswalks. Yeah. 
I think funneling more of that activity into places like this that are curbless may actually end up being safer, mm -hmm. speculative, but I, I can see that being the effect. So I, I really like that part of the idea as well. And I think having you know really good signage to, to mark that as well is important <coughs> for drivers. And then the last thing I was going to make, which is really kind of a small technical thing, and we get our council materials electronically for something like this, and, and it's, it's great, and I, don't pr I hardly print out anything for something like this that uh, is so, so graphic, heavy, visual. I think it would be, I would find it useful to have, uh, have it on these full side pa size papers like, like you guys have. Okay. Just let us know whoever wants them, and Kevin will print them out. And we'll get them okay. out to you guys. You sign yes. up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you put your hands up. You get a count on it. Right. So I have a question about circulation for cars, yeah. um, which is that you know, I I should say I, I, overall I like the um, the changes. I I mean. I'll remain agnostic on the pavers as well. Um, but um, I do like the effect that they create. And I, um, I like the idea of a public plaza space um, that spills out and into uh, a bigger area. But um, my concern is that you know Main Street is a huge funnel for traffic coming from the north. There's no other way for them to get across the river. And, you know, cars coming from East Montpelier, down Main Street, cars coming from Route 12, cars also coming in, um, you know, that don't, that don't turn off onto Route 2. I mean, is there, what is the plan to sort of make a circulation? Um, or is it just simply that this, this plan accepts the traffic as, it's, as it is? Because I think one of the issues, at least with the pedestrian, some of the safety issues is that, Cars coming through downtown Montpelier get frustrated um, because it's a series of stop, 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 stop. Even when, you know, say like a traffic signal says green, but there's two crosswalks in front of it, and so cars get stuck. And I've seen people get very frustrated at that. Um, you know, is there any plan or any idea for making the downtown really, as we make it more pedestrian friendly, perhaps giving cars alternate ways of getting across the river? <coughs> I don't. I don't think that's something that we've um, we've explored. Um, I mean, I, yeah. I, th just a couple other things in terms of the circulation on Main Street. Um, we're kind of going with uh, the the recommendations that came out of that Barry Main scoping study, which would include a traffic light at the Barry and Main intersection, mm -hmm. as well as a mini roundabout at the School Street, a uh, Main um, intersection. So, I don't know how much you can really do to deal with those sort of larger circulation issues. But I mean, I think having a little bit of frustration for drivers in a downtown is sort of to be expected. Um, true, true. <laughs> you know, but it's just, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not someone coming into downtown and thinking, you know, like if I turn on to downtown on um, Bailey and then head yeah. past the state house, I know I'm going into downtown making a choice to do that. Right. As opposed to somebody coming from the north, they really have no choice but to go right. through downtown, even if they really don't want to. Right. I guess um, the, if you do route them off of that, is that putting them through a neighborhood or something? You know, right, so there's or, always a trade-off with that. And, I understand, but I mean, yeah. I, I just wonder, you know, as we make this more pedestrian-friendly, mm -hmm. which I support, I like the idea yeah. of that. I just, you know, seeing on Saturday morning the amount of traffic that gets blocked yeah. on Main Street, seeing the level of frustration that I think people experience when they're stuck in that traffic, right. when they don't want to be, when they don't. They're not, it's one thing to go through downtown. Like, you know, you go into yeah, Manhattan yeah. and you're frustrated. Right, you have yeah. no one to blame but yourself. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if, if, if you can't avoid doing it to just get to the other place you want to get to, I think that would be a highly... Yeah, um, yeah I think the other thing, that just to, you know, one thing that recognizes is that the strategy A and B, there's, there's some flexibility there. Mm -hmm. They're not mutually exclusive, right? right. So... The, the, the emphasis on pedestrianization can be achieved in different ways, depending on, on considerations like what you're describing. Well, and, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I go back when I started in, in some of the planning work, we, had, we, we have the old cityscape that imagined uh, a pedestrian, a completely pedestrian downtown. 
Um, but they also had a circulator that was essentially School Street, Court Street. Yeah. I think they were going to break through the hillside on Cedar to get there. I'm not sure how they <laughs> imagined that, but um, it was the 70s. It was a different time. Um, <laughs> it was a bubble over Winooski. Exactly. Was, there was an air bridge or something. Yeah. But nevertheless, I mean, I, I, I think that is the thing that I see that's missing here is that how do we deal with this? Because the traffic's only going to increase as we encourage people, to, you know, as there's development to the north um, and communities grow. I, I just... I, I wonder, you know, if we don't set ourselves up for this problem that will n not go away and will get worse. And so, you know, the, the traffic backs up at certain times a day and a lot of times a day, um, and it's going to continue to do that. And that may feed people's frustration and take away from really the enjoyment of the downtown um, as, as it is because you have this constant flow of traffic through it. I think you know the point you're. It's again, it's a policy question mm -hmm. ultimately, um, and I think it, if you're putting a marker down through a project like this, a plan like this, that says we as a city want this to be a more pedestrian, walkable downtown, that's one of the consequences that right. you're going to. I mean, we did the St. Albans streetscape, and you know that that is their main street, and there was there's now been uh, alternate routes discovered by the locals. I live near St. Albans. Sure. And and that's what's happened. So there would be some transference of mobility for people who don't want to deal with that. Right. I think the cut, the, but that does not mean it's not a good idea to reclaim your main street for uh, pedestrians. Right. I, I, like I what, don't what happens elsewhere. I don't disagree. I just like, I would like to see, I guess it's just one member. I, I would like to see some consideration to that other than simply say, well, you know, uh, nature will find I mean, a way. I think we can bring up the, that issuing that question to Stantec, the, the traffic engineers mm -hmm. in our team, and just see what they say. I mean, my, my guess is they'll say it, it requires a, another larger study, but you know, it, it, it yeah. may, may need that to really have a definitive answer if there are options. So is this about this? But yeah, and then, and then Lauren. Okay. I think the, question, the, the policy decision is to make a concerted effort that we really talk about not having that second car, not bringing your car downtown, increasing mobility. The micro transit is one of those choices. Ride chair car. I mean, there's lots of right. ways we can try to help reduce traffic downtown, but it'll take a real massive concerted effort. I, I don't um, disagree I, with so, that. Well, yeah. I also want to just jump in here, and, and I just want to make sure that you're aware that we um, had that very Main Street study, a scoping study with some traffic changes planned for that. Right. No, okay. I mean, I, I did review that as okay. well, but okay. I, you know, I, I'm really particularly and have seen, you know, especially from the north that comes down and it's not the bear. I understand we fixed the berry, you know, that, that addresses that, but you know, I, I, and I think there is that, you know, there are those people that that's the way to get that's the only way to get through town. So micro transit may not be the solution if you're coming from Morrisville and you want to get on the highway um, that you happen to come through. And I, I just use that as an example. I understand there are other routes, but um, you know, East Montpelier may be a better example. Um, but I think that's just it's it's a concern and and it it's something we should be thinking about, not just simply in a way of of doing that policy, but you know, is there, how are we going to actually handle this on the streets with this additional traffic? Okay, thank you. Uh, Lauren. Um, I just wanted to, it might be more of a statement, although if you had any more examples to provide, I definitely heard a lot throughout um, of some examples of really looking at kind of flexibility over time, because I do hope that we are moving away from a heavy reliance on single occupancy vehicles and that, you know, so I think the flexibility in this design I really like where we could claim more space for pedestrians and bikes over time as we move in that direction. Um, just kind of curious, and it's a little bit to Dan's point from earlier of the kind of how much, it definitely seems like um, some thought was put into it, but how kind of cohesive is the, you know, the city with the net zero goal and are, you know, knowing that with a changing climate and everything, we need to be developing resilient infrastructure for the new kind of um, climate we're going to have uh, moving forward. And just, just wanted to hear a little bit more about kind of how that has been embedded. I heard a couple examples yeah. um, that you raised, but just how much, how kind of synced up is this plan with helping us achieve our net zero goals and also just the reality of a changing climate and that it's going to be resilient over the long term, the kinds of um, materials and, and everything that we're proposing right. to put in. 
Um, yeah, I think, well, I think a few things uh, we could speak to. Um, I think, you know, talk about sustainability. I mean, one of, the, one of the things of sustainability, I think, is durability and planning for, you know, something that's going to last. So I think that's, that's embedded in it. I think getting more, more green in the downtown core um, through trees that can actually thrive and have enough rooting volume to, to grow well is, is key to our plan. Um, you know, so I didn't get into the details of it, but with the permeable paving, the idea with that would be that you'd have this um, <clears throat> subsurface soil that would be supported in these, um, there's different ways of doing it, but there's soil cells, basically these st structures below grade that can support the pavement and allow you to have good planting soil. And so we're kind of learned in the recent years <laughs> that trees need a lot of volume to actually thrive. And so the old idea of just putting a pit in the ground and surrounding it with, with pavement and not doing anything other than that, it doesn't really work that well long term usually. So really investing in that tree infrastructure so that can have multiple environmental benefits from cleaning the air, uptake of pollutants through the roots, shading the you know um, pavement, shading cars, so that if, you know there's just it's more it's just, you know there's energy savings there, shading buildings, making a cooler environment for yeah for the cars and buildings. Um, so I think those are some of the main things we're looking at, and then also just the idea of like bolstering the riparian buffer and adding stormwater storage and, and treatment. We're doing those things in this plan and trying to integrate it in a way that like works and, and works with the other kind of goals that we have. So, um, based on that, uh, uh, Elizabeth, would you like to say anything? Speak to to any of that? Yeah. Just real quick, um, I'd like to thank Mark and Patrick for a great presentation and. Terrific work. Thank you. Glad that you brought the uh, watershed uh, group along because stormwater is going to be a big part of managing the downtown. Um, so I'd like to make two points to. Be before you get too far, could you identify yourself, please? I'm sorry, Elizabeth Courtney. I live here in town on Clarendon Avenue. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so two um, recommendations, one substantive and one a little frivolous, but we could use a little levity, I think, at this hour <laughs> of the evening. Uh, so recommendation number one is to um, recognize stormwater as an issue that is going to get bigger and bigger for us and um, take that bull by the horns and extend um, our study of the effects of increased stormwater on the downtown from uh, high points draining down into the town and from the river climbing up into the town. We've, we've, got, we've got a water issue. Um, could we extend the work with uh, SE Group and Watershed Consulting uh, and or uh, make sure that the declaration of uh, emergency has an element of the issue of stormwater in it, needing, recognizing stormwater is something that we need to pay attention to. My frivolous point has to do with the title of this report, A Capital Idea. And um, I would rather see this uh, title have something to do with the clock tower of City Hall as opposed to the state capitol dome. Uh, and you will recognize that Taylor Street is the bright line that we didn't cross in this study. And yet we have the Capitol Gold Dome pictured in the, um, yes, so, Excellent. so, and if we had a clock tower, our clock tower, as the symbol for this report, we would be able to say, rather than it's a capital idea, it's uh, an idea that we have no time to waste on. 
because we have an emergency. <clears throat> and with that, I'll say good night. Thank you. You all are wonderful. You can say time you report. Thank you. Although they did, they did spell capital with an A, so they were talking about the city, not the, not the building. Not the building. <laughs> It's still on the other side of Taylor Street. <laughs> uh, I do want to just note, Elizabeth, that we did add some language to the proposed resolution that actually identified Montpelier's issues with increased um, stormwater and um, snowfall, actually. Yes. Um, Connor, did, or I thought I saw a hand over here. I had a quick one. Um, did you consider temporary bike lanes in this? Um, I know in a previous presentation, that had been something brought up. I, I know personally, I, I bike almost every day yeah. in the town, but I'm way too much of a coward to do it in this weather, so <laughs> uh, I imagine some people might be, be like me. Um, so yeah, I just want to know if that was considered. How difficult would it, would it be to set up, if so? <clears throat> uh, and was that with the idea of just testing out bike lanes? Or, as or seasonal. Yeah. Oh, just yeah, seasonal. Uh, we did not explore that as a, an idea. No, um, could kick it, could kick it around, yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, okay, I have one more sort of big thing, sorry. Um, this is maybe towards the, uh, it's not exactly frivolous, but um, uh, leaning that way, perhaps. Okay. Uh, I mean, something that has come up in, uh, other conversations that I've had with people around town. Uh, sometimes people dream about a river walk that goes between the Rialto Bridge and Langdon Street. Okay, was yes. that yes. on the radar? Well, and if it was, and it was, you know, like that's a bad plan, then we yelled that's, at. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's we, fine. we didn't explore it as a connection, a connection. Uh, all the way to Langdon Street, but as an overhanging sort of seated yes, area, right. which we were very excited about, and then was quickly uh, realized, uh, understood okay. that it, it's due to FEMA kind of like okay. regulation, we can't. It's not not doable. Okay, really. well that that's actually really helpful. So yeah. FEMA, yeah, sort of prevent. It. Thank <laughs> yes, you. Yes. That helps. So <laughs> yeah. if, when that conversation comes up again, then that's what I can say. Yeah. Um, so in that same sort of mindset, though. Mm -hmm. um, because the point of that would be to enjoy the river, right? And yeah. that was one of the things that you said was the goal. Um, and so I'll just say that something that I have always, like, wanted uh, is, like, the the walkway along, or the both sidewalks along um, the Main Street Bridge there. I mean, the uh, I always want to just stop and enjoy the river right there. And I don't know that you can really mm -hmm. widen the bridge and so that's, it's probably not realistic to think of any sort of overlooks along the bridge mm. there, but, uh, and I know this is private property, so maybe that's not really realistic to have some kind of a place to enjoy the river here, but that would be delightful. Yeah. And if not on the bridge, and if not in this space to you know watch the waterfall, is there another place that might be fun to, I mean, in some of, I know we're, we're talking about sort of, the, uh, I'm going to orient myself here. Yeah, so like roughly in that space, we're talking about having more green space. Yeah. Um, is the, uh, Anyway, I would love to explore that yeah. as um, just uh, places of delight, sure. right? Like where are the delightful places to sit and enjoy? We, we, we certainly, to, to answer your question directly, I think we did we did look at a number of potential opportunities. And a couple that I'll point out, the Rialto Bridge is an intersection point between the public realm and the river. So that's a really good opportunity. Now, we're obviously hamstrung by virtue of FEMA regulations to doing something grand. And we actually, right. we're, we're very, we were very excited about the opportunity, okay. but that didn't avail itself. I would say where the Shaw's is, for example, <laughs> you know, as it stands today, that's very challenging. But it's not a foregone conclusion that at some point Shaw's redevelops. And what I think the plan, this plan does, and I think what the city's commitment to looking at that riparian zone might do as, as instituted through policy eventually is when that becomes redeveloped, the city's priority would be provide meaningful open space that actually engages the river. 
That's the ask. Mm -hmm. They have to provide open space. They have to provide a buffer anyway. You have the regulations say that now. It's the, the, the conversation with the redevelopment of that particular property would be, we want to make that not just open space. We want to make it connected and functional open space that's part of this opportunity to see the river, to engage with the river. Because that, that as I mentioned earlier, that um, you have a great opportunity to make sure that people see the river not just as a thing that's sort of in a bubble and preserved forever, but it's part of the urban fabric. Right. And I think that would be an opportunity for that to happen. Well, and, and I, I just want to also point out, like, this space here, which is not, I mean, that's not our property. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's, yeah. But it would make a great. Oh, yeah. River, Riverfront Park, yeah, as it's called. It would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'd love to explore, like, what that could look like. Um, and, and also, so as we're thinking of stormwater, um, I think at one point I had this conversation with you about like, let's make this plan really visual. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to reiterate, especially with the stormwater, mm -hmm. what, is, what does it look like um, to be yeah. um, robust in that, terms of? That park um, space that you just pointed out there, the Riverfront Park right off the Langdon, I mean, we could picture that as being something where you're really integrating stormwater with a kind of a park environment, you know, maybe it's sort of like tiered, kind of stepping down mm -hmm. to the river, and there could be capturing stormwater and treating it and making it a visual sort of yeah. garden-y kind of amenity. So, I mean, getting into really detailed plans for any of those individual parcels wasn't really part of this, but we, we're, we're into that. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, and I think I saw Glenn and then Donna. Yeah. yeah just on the uh, question of riverfront spots uh, mm -hmm. and thinking about the Main Street Bridge, I'm curious about the the uh, south bank of the Winooski at the Main Street Bridge, mm -hmm. um, because on both sides of the bridge there, it is already at least grass and trees in a bench, and we put the uh, the uh, winter parking ban sign up on the the left side coming into town. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of a cliff, <laughs> uh, but I, I think it might be worth looking at that. Sorry, the south side of the Winooski. Uh, am I am I wrong saying it that way? So here, I'll just along Memorial Drive. <coughs> right. On your left, going. Yeah. Oh, there right is here. a little park. Yes, it is, but it's, it's like outside big. of this zone. Yeah, yeah it's, it's outside, outside of the zone. Yeah. And I don't know who owns it, but right. it is green on the river. Really cool. Yeah. Okay. We have a bench there. Yeah. 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 Cool. We don't own it. We have a bench. Yeah. Yeah. No, we do. Okay. Good. Yeah, I mean, I think the more you can take advantage of those opportunities along the river to create some public space that people would use, yeah. yeah. And totally. I think in, in, in that spot, to me, it might be just a question of uh, looking at it again and, and thinking about how that's oriented, where, what the bench is looking at. Right now, it's looking at the intersection, yeah. which is fun. <laughs> but yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Facing the intersection. Um, okay. Uh, yes, Donna. You asked earlier about the property against the drawing board, and they have it as a semi-rectangular green space there. Now, did you, are they following up on that? Because they don't designate any of the rest as green uh, that's along the shared youth path near that spot that we just did, or our f new footbridge. Are you talking about the empty lot right there? Yeah. yeah so yeah, we but showed that as potential infill or a pocket park space um, so kind of throwing out either option um, I think from our general recommendations that we're putting out there is the idea of that we had that section that kind of showed the river to Main Street we think we should kind of we should try to maybe emphasize the public open space natural kind of corridor along the river and then go more towards the infill as you get closer to Main Street see in terms of where that priority should happen um, so we, we'd be leaning towards infill, I think, for that spot. One thing we did talk about in, this, in the report, though, you'll see in the recommendations, is, is that if that does get infilled, if it's a, a building, for example, and again, the uses are, are going to be uh, driven by the market and the city's priorities and all of those sorts of things. But one of the opportunities that exists is to look at the frontage of that building as it relates to Main Street maybe a little bit differently. As you can see on the plan, you're, you're, you have a pretty straight line of building facades on Main Street. And one of the things that oftentimes in an urban environment that really makes it dynamic is having some of these forecourts in buildings that provide a little open space in the front of a building. So that would be a great opportunity to, to, to argue for a forecourt on a building like that to allow that, that frontage to actually have a quasi-public you know, gathering point 
and still be able to provide a productive use in terms of a multi-story building. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be, that's one of the things that the strategies are sort of talking about. It's not, it's not necessarily finding the big place for an open space. It's trying to make it where you can. And I would also say, and the study talks about this, is even on the, on the roofs of some of these buildings could be green space, open space. So you can look at open space. You know, one of the things I think the study's trying to do is sort of think, have you think about open space maybe a little bit differently as a city would in that it's not just necessarily reserved, conserved green space. It can be parklets. It can be, you know, four courts of buildings that have a, 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 some benches and a little planter and some art. It can be all of those things can contribute to this civic-minded open space that's presents, presents itself to the public. Um, Lauren, did you have something to add? No, okay. Uh, I think, uh, any, uh, yeah. Elizabeth, again, um, probably taking the words out of uh, Dan's mouth, but uh, these are great ideas and with a little bit of interpretive signage you could turn this town into, you know, a magnet for uh, people in, in the state to come learn how to manage stormwater. And um, they, of course, would want to spend the night. They would want to eat and drink in town and buy stuff. So it would be good. Great. Are you suggesting stormwater tourism? <laughs> stormwater tourism. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All the state officials. Yeah. Stormwater, <laughs> stormwater <laughs> management <Yeah>. tourism. <laughs> I like, no, not at all. <laughs> no, that, that would have involved much more intelligent words being in my mouth. No. Um, you glossed over a little bit the point that this plan is dependent on the parking garage. And I know that you here don't need to hear this again, but I want to make the point anyway for the people listening at home that I think when we talked about the parking garage, we talked about these opportunities where we can you know, maybe remove some on-street parking spaces in order to improve the pedestrian experience, <laughs> to create more open space, to create environmental opportunities and stormwater treatment opportunities. This is what we were talking about. So the, you know, the so-called friends of Montpelier, they're not friends to pedestrians, they're not friends to bicyclists, and they're not friends to the environment when they're opposing the parking garage, because the parking garage is what it would take to provide a new way of looking at our downtown that's going to create great energy, that's going to allow people to park on the outskirts of the core downtown, and then have a walking experience that's you know, full of those moments of, of excitement and energy that, that we were talking about. So I, I think that's really important for everyone to recognize that we need those parking opportunities on the outskirts so that we can reconsider our street. And it's not an efficient use of our streets to have on-street parking. Structured parking is a much more efficient and viable way to have people park. So um, I, I just want to reiterate that as we're considering these plans, that it but for having a parking garage, they're all pie in the sky dreams because we need places for people to park, to be able to shop, and to enjoy our downtown. So the parking garage is really critical to this piece. So okay. just want to make sure we're not glossing over that, that that's at the core of this discussion. Okay, thank you. Great point, Dan. If, if some of the vacant, existing vacant areas or spots where maybe land, current landowners are not open to, like next to Charlie O's, there was a park that was, yeah. was built. So like that space there, which I think is essential to have, you know, one of these, how do you deal with that? If, if you know, or is there a proposal to offer any of these private abandoned sectors um, I don't know. You okay, know. Just, <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot that we own and control, but obviously there's a lot that we don't as well. Um, and when we develop these plans, we recognize there are going to be um, opportunities that exist on private property um, that may be necessary to make connections. And so what we do is we point them out and identify what our opportunities are, and we decide whether that's something that we think is a good idea. And then we recognize that there's obviously a barrier 
to implementation. And that barrier is the fact that we don't own that property. In some cases, that barrier may be relatively low. We may have a willing partner in the private sector who's willing to work with us and says, hey, great. Um, I, I can get an advantage out of this because it's better for my customers, it's better for the people who live there. Other people are more challenging to work with when it comes to acquiring property, and we just have to recognize that. So when we highlight something that says, hey, this would be a great place for, for a park or for redevelopment, we just have to sit down you know, afterwards and go and say, yeah, there's a great opportunity, but the, the cost to actually getting that to happen is, is higher than we're willing to spend. So. Uh, but that's a policy decision of the city council. From a planner's perspective, we want to put those opportunities in front of you and say, here's a great opportunity, but here's its, the barrier that sits there as well. So um, certainly there are a few examples in here that are privately owned properties that, that could be redeveloped. Um, and sometimes we get the opportunities. I, I would point out for something like Shaw's, you know, we mentioned earlier about we can't require public access on a, on a private redevelopment, but almost every large project that has come through the city, they have come asking for a public-private partnership. They would like something from the city to enable their project <coughs> to move forward. Maybe it's tax stabilization, maybe it's these other things. Now in the zoning regulations, we can't consider that public access at all. But when somebody comes in for a tax stabilization, when somebody comes in for a public-private partnership to say, hey, I can do this great project, but I need some help from the city, that's when you have the opportunity to go and say, well, if we're going to help you out, I want you to help us out. We'd love to go and use your, your riparian buffer as an opportunity for us to have some green space. And that's where these public-private partnerships come in. We can't do it through zoning, but we can do it through other tools and certainly when somebody comes to you with their handout for an assistance on a project, there's an opportunity for you to work with them to make an agreement. Okay. Great. Um, any further comments? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank all you your much. time and effort on this project. It's great. I'm looking forward to uh, we'll do it moving forward. March. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess there's, for anyone who's, who's listening or any, uh, anyone on the council, you know, we, we did put they did put together this recommendation just so that way you guys have, have it in front of you, could start getting input and comment from um, folks in the community. And you can send us questions. And the whole point is to, to get this out here and get another little round of conversation going. We're not looking to kind of re reopen everything for restudy, but we do want to hear where there might be things that maybe we overlooked that we should take another look at. So. Um, Donna. We'll be back one more time. Oh, okay. What's my question? So you'll be back one more time? Yes. Okay. So it's really important the public also understands that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Could I, I just make one more comment? Sure. Um, could uh, Patrick and Mark make the boards available that were here in this room some months ago to Put have a hallway. show That'd in the great. hallway so that people can just drop in and Get a put them out in hallway. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't give you the boards from a couple months ago because they've changed. Yes. Right. Like yeah. Current, the current ones. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. That, that would be helpful. Super. Especially, uh, especially town, town meeting. meeting day. Yeah. 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 The town meeting would be good. Glenn, did you have something? No. Nope. Okay. Anything further? No. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is David Papirsky. I was just curious, what is the timeline for starting and finishing? The construction? <laughs> <laughs> this summer. <laughs> By January? Just, just no. a question. Uh, it's, um, so the, the initial concept of, of this plan actually comes from the fact that um, we can look ahead and know that the Rialto Bridge was going to need to get reconstructed at some point, and so we were actually looking specifically at State Street, and then it grew into the downtown. The, the idea is we don't really know when we would be starting, but in order to build it into a project, we need to have first the master plan identified what do we want to see. Do we want bike lanes or not want bike lanes? Do we want on-street parking or not want on-street parking? We needed the big questions answered so we could start building some plans so that way when the Rialto Bridge is replaced, we can also do the sidewalks on either end of it. Um, when, when we, the question of when we would start a project like this is, you know, 
it's, it's up to a lot of projects funding the will of people willing to, to bond and spend money. Um, but we're really, we wanted to get the plans going and um, it would be something that would take a little bit of time. It's, it's not something that's going to be in <coughs> next year's budget. It's going to take some time. I guess I thought we were going to sort of piecemeal it because the Rialto Bridge is moving along. I mean, in the regional TAC, we see it at two and a half, three years. Yeah, if that's and happening that so quick, then if we'll we be don't able. have this plan in place, then that gets done. But so we want to have the plan in place so yes. we can do that and do it the way we want it. And likewise, every time we have another capital improvement grant, it's just an opportunity to, to know where we want to go. So I don't see it as a big whoop, here we are. I see it bit by bit happening as we get the money and the grants to do it. Yes, and I think. Bill and Donna would probably agree with that, that it's probably not one big bond, bond for $16 million and start start the big dig. It's going to be a, um, it'll, it'll be a piecemeal project. And, it, and as I said, the timing really comes in where the opportunities present themselves. And one will be the Rialto Bridge. If that's in two and a half years, then we're probably needing to, to hustle to get to what we, these guys would be going and getting into design. Um, and getting design documents so that way they're in place in time for the bid bridge because you would bid, uh, bid the entire project. Um, so, Mike, and Mike's right. There's a probably about a two-year-plus time lag between the idea and and design and design drawings because there is going to be some permitting. There is going to be some landowner negotiation. There is going to be obviously the level of detail will get considerably refined relative to the concept that's presented. So you, if, if it's three years, uh, that, that clock tower thing is looking better every minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it is a little after nine. Um, yes, Donna? Okay. I would request a break. So here's my proposal. Um, uh, I would like to be leaving here at least by 10, um, and I, I would love to s like s reserve an hour to do the city manager evaluation. Um, it's going to be <laughs> probably less than it's that now. Less than that, yeah. So um, I, uh, I if I get that's okay. I'll just leave. That's okay. No, no. no. Well, so what I would propose is that we're that we push off the legislative agenda piece until next. Meeting. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. You know um, the session ends. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, we were late to start anyway. So um, <laughs> two minutes. Yeah. No, no. I mean, like, with the idea of a legislative. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So uh, if we could take that, if you're if you're okay with that, team. I just that. Yeah. Like the, like the one thing I'd say is I, I think at the very least. Uh, somebody, whether it be a volunteer, and I can probably take a whack at it, to look through all the committee schedules every week to see what are on the agendas and interesting. Mm -hmm. Today, today, two things came up, and I looked at it. It's a pilot mobile mental health unit for the city of Rutland oh, to deal wow. with homeless population that they're asking $400,000 for. So we're fighting over peanuts mm -hmm. here. You know, we should be in there looking at stuff like that. Mm -hmm. State employee parking was on the agenda today in Senate Government Operations. I think we should be in the conversation on those things. Uh, at the very least, just looking at the agendas for the week. Hey, Ken Russell, maybe you should pop over there and check it out. So, um, so one possibility is that we do council reports now and then go into executive session. Do you want to take a break before? My body, I'm going. Yeah, yeah it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I'll be back. Okay. Uh, so we'll take that up, but uh, thank you. Okay. The point is well taken. Yep. Good um, idea. Uh, okay, but we're going to move to council reports. Uh, and then we'll, after we're do, through that, we'll then we'll go into uh, executive, executive session to do the city manager's evaluation. So um, Donna not being here, with whom I usually start. Connor, are you good? Okay. okay, Glenn? Uh, I think all I have to say is I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, uh, as usual, 8.30 to 9.30. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, Dan? Uh, I wanted to thank Orca for uh, setting up interviews for all of the candidates that are currently running, as well as the city manager and uh, the school board, talking about budgets with the superintendent. And I would encourage everyone to watch all of them, um, maybe not in their entire length. You can 
fast forward through mine. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a really good way to sort of get an idea of who's what, what the issues are outside of sitting through all these city council meetings. Jack. A while back we said we would start having uh, council members report on the committees they're working on and uh, I thought this is probably a reasonable time to report on what's happening with the Main Street Middle School Committee. You know, we've been meeting since uh, September or something like that, and we meet once a month, and we're uh, making progress. That we've been gathering information, including surveying uh, the teachers, and we'll be uh, doing the same thing to uh, or a similar survey or other mechanism to obtain uh, in, uh, feedback from students at the school. Another part of the, uh, of the charge of the committee is considering if there are alternative locations for, uh, for a school if we conclude that it's not going to be possible to meet the needs in the current location. And we've done a lot of work in, of, of uh, evaluating the space in the school and uh, what used to be the school construction standards and things that maybe the school has or doesn't have that really should have and so we're, we're working on developing design ideas for what could be done in the building in its current location and how we could meet those needs but we're also starting to look at uh, the question of whether there are locations within the city that would also uh, serve to be good sites for for the school. Um, probably in about two months we'll be uh, doing a report at the school board and the uh, project is planned to wrap up at the end of this year, so uh, in December. And it's not going to be Here's the decision about whether we're going to build a new school and where, but it's it's going to be fleshing out a lot of the ideas that would go into that decision and uh, and some of the alternatives to meet the educational needs of the district. And Dan is also on that committee. Accurate report. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple quick things. Um, there is. A I believe next meeting, um, we're going to be hoping to appoint someone to the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District as the alternate on that. Um, would love if somebody would uh, throw their hat in the ring if, if people haven't already. Um, that would be great. Lots of exciting stuff going on in terms of you know, mandatory composting statewide going into effect July of this year and other really interesting changes in um, what's happening. So it would be great to have some good volunteers uh, coming forward for that. Um, for the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee that I serve on for the council, um, just noting there is out right now a request for proposals. So if anybody um, knows of any groups or is somebody who works on social and economic justice issues, check out that um, RFP and uh, consider submitting an application to work with the city. Um, so there's a lot of details in there of the kind of work that we're looking for. but. Um, hope you got some some great uh, interest in applicants for that. Um, that group also, because it will be this really interesting time of working through that process with a consultant and really kind of advancing the mission of that group, um, also looking for members for that group. So um, if anyone's interested, uh, would, would love to encourage people to participate in that. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention, I had emailed the council, but some of you might have seen the report on the PFAS contamination coming out of our um, wastewater treatment facility. And I know we're going to put that on a future agenda. So just wanted to note, though, like certainly your city councilors saw that, and it's an issue we'll be looking at and trying to get a better grasp of what the city's options and obligations are. Um, so I look forward to that discussion. Um, and that's it for this week. Thanks. Donna, you're last. Oh, last. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really want to thank Orca and Richard Shear for our interview. Connor and I shared it. But he interviewed all the candidates. He interviewed the city manager, the school superintendent. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. So people should go on to Orca and look at these 
discussions of your schools and your city government. And I also want to say I had a delightful conversation about integrating school transportation with public transit with VEEP, Vermont Energy Education Program. And they've got some ideas for some pilot projects that are really exciting. Sorry, I forgot until just now. Um, I promised a, a constituent, Jessica Sanderson of Berlin Street, that I would pass on a message that I got from her. I'll forward it to the rest of you, but um, the gist is uh, she is uh, strongly concerned about the um, snow removal in the city. Um, walking and uh, driving uh, is uh, getting more and more difficult and uh, is concerned that we do not have an adequate budget uh, for uh, snow removal. Uh, so I will forward that along. Uh, and apologies to Jessica for not remembering it until just now. I know I promised. So it is. It is. Okay. Uh, so just a couple points for me. So uh, I'll also be having office hours, uh, but that will be next Tuesday, uh, 3.30 to 4.30, uh, right here at City Hall. Um, I want to make a note that for the uh, city council, um, we had a, uh, Don reminded me that we do um, self-evaluations as well. I sent out a survey for that. Um, don't think that that's something that we can do in executive session, but maybe that's a conversation we can reserve for a time at the end, you know, during the uh, council reports, just a, some time to reflect on, on that. Um, but uh, filling out that survey would be useful. So uh, I'll send that out uh, again um, later on. And, and obviously, um, Dan being new, don't feel obligated. Um, I, I won't. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's great. <laughs> do, do you have a deadline? I work much better with deadlines. Uh, OK, so <laughs> if that well, were to if, if you're going to do it with this group, you have one more meeting. Exactly. Tonight. Right, so the 26th. <laughs> Um, it'd be great to, to do that with the, on the 26th. Um, so, and really that means ideally getting it done by the 20th, which is a week from tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right, so then I just want to also make a note that um, at one point we had hoped to have the Home Energy Information Ordinance on uh, tonight's agenda. We had, uh, because we had it, planned for tonight's agenda that pushed the group to um, do a few things to get some feedback um, from lawyers and uh, we met with uh, realtors and uh, both of those things were very fruitful and so um, and had substantive enough enough um, suggestions that we were like okay we want to take some time and digest this and um, come back to the council with um, something more uh, that, that integrates uh, the suggestions and, and also, um, yeah, just, just considers all the, the things that were brought up. Um, so just wanted to make a note about that. And then on a slightly different note, I just want to make a note for uh, the public that the census is coming up and uh, starting in March that uh, people will start to be receiving uh, information about that. And the census is really important for us. Uh, in order to, uh, uh, it, it's tied to basically funding um, for a lot of different um, areas. So uh, that translates for us into more resources. Um, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. And that is it for me. Um, Crystal, do you have anything? Um, I will just remind people that taxes are coming due um, with the weekend and the Monday holiday. They will be due on Tuesday the 18th. And uh, for me, uh, thank you, Crystal, for reminding me to remind everyone that Monday is President's Day holiday, so City Hall will be closed. Um, tomorrow is Vermont League of Cities and Towns Local Government Day, so state uh, local government officials from around the state will be gathering first at the Capitol Plaza, then at the State House to talk about local government issues. I was anxiously looking forward to bringing our agenda with us, <laughs> um, but maybe we'll co-op some of the ideas anyway. Um, and I will be involved in that. Cameron will be there. I think Donna Barlow Casey is going to that. We will be. We are. Our goal is to have a report on the PFAS for Fridays packet when it comes out I think they're gonna make it 
um, DPW. If not, it'll be first of next week. Just to take that. Um, so we appreciate that. Uh, police chief ads are out. We have begun that process. Uh, we've already had two applications. Uh, it's due, I think, March 16. Is that right? So there's some time, and we're going to be doing. In the meantime, we're doing, doing some outreach with community groups and others to get some feedback about uh, what they'd like to see in the next police chief. So certainly, I'm welcome, interested in hearing from any of you if you want to share your thoughts with me. Uh, snow removal was mentioned, and I wanted to mention it as well. It isn't really a budget issue. We had a, a major problem this week. If anyone's seen our, sto our snow removal operation, uh, we rent very large trucks and they f get filled and they haul off uh, and dump them and then another truck comes in and gets filled and it's the most efficient way to do that. And this particular week, we actually planned to do snow removal uh, last night or last, yeah, last night. And uh, due to an emergency with the truck provider, those trucks weren't available. So uh, for us to do it with just the small trucks, we get a lot less done. It's a lot less efficient. And with, uh, the, uh, with the storm coming potentially tonight, uh, we would have had our crews too burned out to, to do them that way. There will be a plan, even if it is doing it with the inefficient small trucks after this snow to get cleaned up uh, for the weekend and around schools, we recognize it's bad. It should have been done. Um, but was not actually able to be done. And we tried to send out a notice through Facebook and other, other social media providers, but it was, it's not, you know, we do budget for the truck rentals. We do budget for the overtime to do it. Uh, just that was what happened this week. Great. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, is there a motion to go into executive session? I move we go enter into an ex executive session to discuss the evaluation of a public officer or employee pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3. I'll second it. Okay, and I just want to note that we will not be coming back to do any business. Um, so, okay, um, noting that, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you all. <laughs>